That's okay. Um, old school mentality. The biggest don't get paid. Thank you. You did know the speech you made the mayor right? I don't know if you heard about the meeting here. Okay, we can't. Okay. Okay, no. I'm not blame my nose like I did. I didn't blame you. Good evening. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, welcome to the City Council study session. Um, just want to welcome everyone here. Um, our first item on the agenda this evening is um, the RTD Chair and District Representative uh, meeting. Uh, the Board Chairman, Mr. Tisdell, and also Jeff Walker are here to give us an update on activities associated with the RTD Board and Directors Good evening, gentlemen. It's very nice to have you. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem and Councilors. It's a pleasure for us to uh, be here uh, to give you an update, and we know that your time is short, so we'll try to keep this very straightforward. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I will point out that uh, the views expressed uh, are my own, prepared by me, and do not necessarily represent the views of the RTD, our senior leadership team, the board, or General Manager Genova, or for that matter, probably even me. Um, I do uh, uh, need to do that disclaimer. We have a very tough general counsel. Let me just make sure we, uh, we reflect upon that. So let me tell you about some of the things that may be of interest to you. Uh, first of all, concerning fast tracks, uh, a 40,000 foot uh, overview. General Manager Dave Genova is currently working on a full report to the board and to the public addressing questions that have always been raised uh, over the past several years regarding the completion of fast tracks. That report should be out by April. But in the meanwhile, the most frequent question that I get asked is, why isn't it done yet? And people ask that. So uh, what we have done is we've prepared a brief summary, and it will be extended in much fuller uh, length in that report. Let me talk about some of the factors. Factors beyond the control of RTD uh, militated substantial costly changes in the 2004 voter approved fast tracks program that had originally been designed and cost estimated in 2003. 15 years ago. Those factors include the following. First, the freight railroads that were providing the right of way required that the North Metro Line, the Gold Line, and the University of Colorado A Line utilize Federal Railroad Administration compliant technology. And that includes positive train control, signal systems, equipment, reporting requirements, and hour of service requirements for employees thus turning what were designed as light rail lines into more costly commuter rail lines. Secondly, local governments lobbied us that the trains be electric powered rather than diesel powered. So going to an electric train is more expensive. It's not just taking a Lionel train and making it bigger. It's a lot more expensive. Additional environmental impact statement requirements and local government drainage and traffic requirements were imposed upon us as well. There was a dramatic increase in the right-of-way acquisition costs that the railroads were charging and significantly increased construction materials cost over time and, of course, the Great Recession of 2008-2009 which dramatically reduced our tax revenues for an extended period. And our tax revenues represent something in the neighborhood of 60 to 65 percent of what we do as an agency. The fare box doesn't really cover uh, our operations. So that's just a quick overview on Fast Tracks with the promise that we will have this more complete report, as I say, probably sometime in April, and we will see to it that all of you receive a copy of that so you can have more information relative to fast tracks. Second thing I wanted to bring up is uh, what I call Swari. Now, you've heard about Siri. Uh, that's the southeast rail extension, and that will take us from the Lincoln Station down to the new Lone Tree Station. That will open in 2019. Currently, the southwest rail extension, the Swari, is contemplated for some time after 
40. Uh, this is due to the economic realities that I've just mentioned to you now. But we here in the South and in the Southwest portion of the region can take a lesson from what happened with the Siri, the Southeast Rail Extension. In that case, there was an unprecedented collaboration with public and private entities. The city of Lone Tree led the charge and with Douglas County and other governments and private interests, they came up with matching funds that paid something like 18% or so, more or less, for that project. Now that match enabled RTD to shoot up to the very top of the list for federal matching grants that enabled us to build the Siri years ahead of schedule. Now, I have proposed in public meetings that we've had with stakeholders, even before I got elected, when Kent Bagley was my predecessor in office, that we try to develop what I call a 2020 vision for the SWARI, for the Southwest Rail Extension. If we can get a 20% match from local governments and private enterprises by 2020, and that's roughly a $20 million or so commitment, we could consider the possibility of breaking ground in 2020, which is 20 years earlier than our budget presently allows. That's why I call it a 2020 vision. Speaking of the Siri, let's talk a little bit more about that for a second. You may have heard that we're closing the Lincoln Station and the Dry Creek Station as of this Friday night to be reopened on March 26, so a 10-day shutdown. That's done in order that we can complete the tie-in for the extension from the south to tie in with the Lincoln Station and continue on, because there's a lot of heavy rail work that has to be done with that, or a lot of light rail work, I should say, has to be done with that. Uh, that process is being done in conjunction with work that CDOT is doing on 470 at Dry Creek. So the plan was, rather than having two separate interruptions of traffic, we would consolidate the work and have CDOT do its work up at Dry Creek and 470 while we were doing the work at Lincoln to do the tie-in for the Siri. So I'm happy to say that due to cooperation that we received, from the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 1001, we will have a bus bridge in place at those <coughs> stations that hopefully will minimize the inconvenience that actually literally thousands of computers would otherwise experience. That is our most trafficked line in the system. Then let me talk about the DCPA. I said, what does the DCPA have to do with RTD? Well, the biggest complaint that I have heard since being elected chair by Director Walker and the other directors on the board, uh, other than the complaints we had about the R-line service reductions, that's the line that goes through Aurora along 225, the biggest complaint that I've heard centers around changes in service on the C and the D lines here to the southwest that we instituted in January. The bottom line of that complaint is people would take the D train downtown to the DCPA to see a show and then not be able to take the D train back home because we changed the service times and they were rather upset with that fact. So we have a four-pronged fix that is now in the system. Let me first note that the current situation does not mean that riders are abandoned downtown. They can take the 16th Street Mall shuttle to Union Station and they can catch a C train there that will bring them back on down. But that does require some additional travel from DCPA to Denver Union Station. So we are now taking these steps. First, we are adding a 10.05 p.m. D train. Previously, we were ending under this new plan, the D-Line service at 9.30 p.m., so we hope that that will catch a lot of the theater crowd by doing it at 10.05. Second, we are coordinating the H train with the D train. What that means is this. Theater goers 
may board an H train right at the DCPA, at the convention center DCPA station, and ride that to I-25 and Broadway. Mr. Tisdale, are we allowed to ask questions or are we holding them until the end? I'm sorry, again. Are we holding all questions until the end? I was wondering if maybe we could just because I want to kind of set the table, and I'm happy to answer any and all questions, and Director Walker is here to correct anything that I misstate because undoubtedly I will at some point, not intentionally, but that just happens. But what we'll do is we'll have people get on the H train, take it to I-25 and Broadway, where there will be a C train waiting for them. We are coordinating the H trains and the C trains so that there will not be extended wait periods out in the cold or the snow while waiting for the train to come. And third, we are checking with DCPA for major events, and we will be adding special service trains for major events, as we often do for the large sporting events that we have in the evening. When the Broncos play on Monday night or Thursday night, we put on special trains. And we already have extra cars on the regularly scheduled trains at night following major events at DCPA. And much of that, as you know, has been due to the success of Hamilton downtown at the Buell Theater and lots of people going to that. And then fourth, we are looking at adding another D train, so a direct train, at 10.35 p.m., pushing that, capturing even more. So as with any change, we'll check on the passenger demand and we'll make adjustments. These changes are intended to go into effect in May, although some are being advanced right now and, again, due in large part to the success of Hamilton. Next, briefly, our collective bargaining agreement. I'm glad to report to you that we have successfully concluded negotiations with the Amalgamated Transit Union for a new three-year collective bargaining agreement. The union has approved that. They had a vote over the weekend, and the board will be taking up the matter tomorrow night. And then next, you've heard perhaps about the PASS Program Working Group. And the PASS Program Working Group was initiated by us roughly a year and a half ago to have a comprehensive study of all passes and various accommodations that we make at the RTD for fares. The board will hear an interim report from the staff regarding the PASS Program Working Group tomorrow night. This is part of a long process. The, the working group has now completed its task and has come forward with a series of recommendations to us. Those recommendations have to be vetted and tweaked by our senior leadership team. Then they come to the board for extended discussion and consideration. Next, uh, a, a topic near and dear to many people's hearts, uh, the Public Utilities Commission and the University of Colorado A line and also the G line, the gold line that goes out to Arvada and Wheat Ridge. Two weeks ago, uh, actually, no, strike that, four weeks ago, an administrative law judge at the Public Utilities Commission took uncontested, uncontroverted, voluminous evidence submitted by the RTD regarding the lack of need for continuing the crossing guards on the University of Colorado A-Line. The Federal Railroad Administration has already reviewed and approved the positive train control system, sometimes we call that the PTC, that we have in place for the A-Line, and they said that the guards may be removed. But the PUC has a concurrent state jurisdiction over the question of crossing guards, and they have yet to agree with the FRA. We are confident that the PUC will ultimately and soon agree with all the experts, all the interested parties, and the Federal Railroad Administration that our positive train control system works as designed and the crossing guards will be removed this year, which also opens the way then for the institution of quiet zones along the line. And then lastly, and then I'll let Director Walker supplement with what he has, and then we'll have to answer any questions, and, and hopefully in a way that will uh, give you information. Uh, we were asked about the Englewood Station parking, 
and Director Walker has a lot more information on that than I do, but I'll share with you what I have, and we'll check with Director Kent Bagley, my predecessor, relative to some of that also. I am informed that at some point, RTD had uh, indicated that there would be an additional 350 spaces at the Englewood Station, apparently as part of the Fast Tracks plan. As I understand it, a study was done sometime before 2011 or so, and a site was selected. Soil samples were analyzed and so forth for a parking lot in the vicinity of the southeast quadrant of Dartmouth and Santa Fe. As I understand it, there was apparently a, a fair amount of neighborhood protest over that. That project was put on hold, and as, as I understand it now, and we're more than happy to work with the city on this, it appears that it may be uh, essential to find a, uh, a suitable alternative location for those spaces, and of course, we'll be happy to cooperate with that. So that's my rush through report, and I'm sorry it went a little longer than I thought, but I wanted to make sure I had the opportunity to give you some detail on items that may be of interest to you. And Director Walker, this is, this is his district. You're sitting in his district right now, so what would you like to add to that? It's your district. I just get to represent it. <laughs> uh, I, I won't add anything to that so we can get right to the question. Okay, so are there any questions? Um, Council Member Wink. Thank you. Uh, so regarding the extension of the, uh, the evening hours on the D-line coming back from DCPA, right. um, what percentage of the Southwest Line riders are theater goers? Well, I, that I can't tell you. I can tell you that Southwest I line, have, u line users. I mean, right? I, I have received probably a hundred different contacts, emails, telephone calls, and... Um, I think I got one letter, and the rest have been emails and telephone calls from people uh, concerned about that. Because when we did the changes, by dropping the D, the, the, the point is this, C and D. I understand perfectly well. I take the C and D all the time, so okay, right. I understood that part of it. I just wondered how, what percentage <coughs> of the total population for our C and D lines at evening time were well, there's theater goers, and, and what percentage of those did actually respond to your data collection instrument, whatever that uh, was. I, I can tell you this, that the, uh, the number of comments that we received, and mm -hmm. we're looking at some of these changes tomorrow night at our meeting, uh, if you look at all of the very, we have like five pages of comments on all the various changes, probably a page and a half were D-line comments that uh, writers had given us. And I know that those trains are full at night after the theater. They're very full during the day, too. And, and, and during <laughs> the day as well, but we didn't adjust the, the times on that. It was cutting off that evening time that really caused this particular issue that we're addressing. Thank you. And regarding the Englewood Station additional parking you were discussing when you spoke about um, the issue now on hold, I just want to clarify for my... Um, Edification. The Southwest Quadrant, are you, does that mean the, the area where the SAMS automotive? The Southwest Quadrant of Dartmouth. Oh, Dartmouth. Well, I, I Dartmouth. think it was I, southeast, I was yes, but it's, yeah, Got it. Dartmouth. Right. Thank you. I'm okay. Okay, thank you. Council Member Martinez. Um, thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, do you have any updated information on the Englewood Trolley ridership? Um, is it still up there with the zero and the 15 bus? I do uh, I don't remember what the ridership is, but it's somewhere close to 30 boardings an hour, which is our uh, urban service. So, so the, it's classified as suburban service, but it's, uh, its ridership is up there with the urban. So it's somewhere around 30 boardings an hour. Okay. So it, it does really, really well. Yes, yeah. for sure. Last it's time really we heard, I was good, like yeah. really impressed with the ridership. Um, and then you mentioned um, for the Southwest Rail Extension needing 20% match from the local governments. What other local governments would need to participate in that? Us well, it's not a question of need. It's a question of who wants to step forward. Right. Uh, City of Lone Tree, as I say, led the charge, and they got Douglas County, um, and uh, I believe Centennial also participated in that, but uh, I can't say that with certainty. Uh, and then <coughs> private uh, enterprise uh, participated, and that's what yielded that roughly 18 percent 
uh, contribution that they made. And I, quite honestly, simply rounded it to 20 because I said, well, it's about $20 million. If we get 20 percent by the year 2020, I think we'll be able to go to the government and get some matching grants and say, okay, it's time for us to do this and to move forward. But it will take that kind of dramatic move mm -hmm. for that to happen because otherwise I don't think the federal government is in a position to say they'll do anything to help us out. Sure. So it would be 20 percent of 20 million? No, 20 percent of 100 million for a 20 million oh, okay. match. Gotcha. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Olson. Thanks for sharing and informing us today. I have, I think, two questions then, because I think it's 20%. Um, so the PASS coordinating uh, working group, you're studying the, it, it, are you studying the PASS, the use of the EcoPASS, for, the performance of that? Is that what it Eco is? EcoPASS, Youth Pass, College Pass, uh, all of the PASS programs that we have and all of the fair pricing that we have. And they've come up with a list of 11 or 12 recommendations relative to fixes that they would propose. The difficulty, of course, is that every time you do a change like that to increase a discount, extend a discount, you've got to make up that revenue somewhere. And so they have tried to come up with some plans that will address that, and senior leadership will be going through that further. So what, what were they fixing? You well, said the fixes, so I don't know, what, was, what were the problems that you were exploring? Is it just whether or not it's performing financially the way it principle, should, the, readers, the right. readership is where they think it is? Or I know a number of people in my neighborhood that use it. They either come over here and go up or they go to the north and go out. One of the big issues that we were presented with was that there was a significant uh, felt need for uh, providing a low-income pass and to make that an opportunity. And so one of the recommendations that has been made is that people who are earning less than 185% of the federal poverty level would receive a 40% discount on passes. This is, I'm just reporting what the pass program working group said. This is nothing in terms of what the board has agreed to or recommended. This is what we're going to hear in greater detail tomorrow night. Um, and then on when we formally start working on it after the senior leadership team finishes its work. Uh, that was one fix. The other was to provide for uh, youth, uh, but currently youth between uh, uh, zero and five, let's say, get to ride for free, and the uh, suggestion has been made that from zero to 12 ride free if they are with a fair paying writer. Um, and uh, then uh, the college pass also, I think the indication was to uh, increase the discount associated with the college student pass as well. And all of those were developed and the other recommendations were developed by the pass program working group after having a series of public meetings and let me point out, the, the group itself was 25, I think 25 people that were stakeholders uh, from all across the board, from nonprofits to schools to businesses to chambers of commerce and the rest, to give us a good full picture of uh, what the felt needs were in the community. So will you forward to us any of the recommendations when they're public and what, what's discussed and decided? They're already available. Okay. If you were to go to the RTD site, which is rtd-denver.com, uh, there is a, uh, a page for the PASS program working group. I believe their recommendations are posted there. In addition, our board agenda, which is a public meeting and a public agenda, as you all can appreciate more than most, uh, and uh, that report is there on our website with our board so material. So what's the timeline for the decision on this? The process is that the SLT will go through this for the next four to six weeks. Okay, so there's still time to give input based on what the recommendations yes. are. Okay, great, great. And then the, the second question is, since we've been talking about this for a number of years, these 300 extra spaces, what would the process be for us to reconsider other places for that at um, this point where you see it going? Because we've done this before, been down this road. And 
So, so I remember just before I was appointed to the board, uh, there was a study done that looked at a series of spaces, locations for the, for the space. The one was settled on. Uh, we started doing some preliminary engineering. It was decided uh, that that was no longer a viable option or preferred option. So um, it's been a while since we've talked about this, but yeah. the last I remember was that the city would try to identify a location. Um, well, I, we eliminated some based on distance from the station, so they just weren't useful. Um, anyway, so short of it is, uh, the city would have to identify that location. We'd have to go through the process again of, right, of determining how much it would cost, the money available to build it, and what time frame we would be able to build it, um, looking at the soils to see how it would be designed and the soil and that kind of thing. Um, I think every, every place around here is owned by a private property owner. So, so we're sort of still at the same place we were back when. It's not like something all of a sudden came up and so now you're Except that, is there a statute of limitations in terms of how long this available no, 300 sites agreement is? No, no, it's it's a part of fast tracks, if I yeah. remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, it is. So yeah. as long as that plan is valid, unless the voters change it, we're obligated to build it. But there's a particip there's a participatory element to it. So I I haven't heard recently about capacity and where if we've just really maxed out or if it's still really just about the same as it's been in the past in terms of parking. Do we know? We those? do a we do a scan of that. The surface lot that's just to the north of the Lexington Apartments is always full. Yeah. Um, the parking here on the deck, there's still some capacity, but not much. And I'm I'm wondering, given the fact that we're talking about the southwest extension, if that occurred. Would that maybe eliminate the need for the additional parking here, as you'd have fewer people parking here and they'd park right. southwest? Hmm. There's pro probably a number of there are probably a number of people who will park here because it's a relatively easy parking area to access. Uh, who would, if we had that extension and those stations and the attendant parking with it, uh, they would change their habits and park there. Uh, I don't know because you'd have yes. to do a license plate study. <laughs> yeah. That was a yes, right? <laughs> yes, you think it might change once, so we might need to wait to see what this works. What, one of the things that we do see is that folks who live farther out who would buy a regional yeah. pass, mm -hmm. they park closer. So right, we know that. Right. <laughs> yes. we, have, we have residents who live in the city who can't get in there and yeah. park elsewhere like, like some of people yeah. that I know would prefer to get on the C or D line, but they go up to university instead and then make that shift at Broadway uh, for no, a number of different reasons because that's where they're. Yeah, so I think they would be really glad to know that it's easier to park over mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever. Yeah. Sorry, not there. That's perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I would like to know if there's anything, that if there's a, well, maybe we should do a survey of the parking again to know, and then, but if this, this other line. We do, we do survey the parking capacity, um, and we do know that the capacity report is a quarter of a million. Yeah. Um, all of them on the southwest line are over 90%, mm. pushing 100%. Some, some are more than others. Um, I'll, I'll say 95. I don't remember. I, 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 I think the mineral station is like a 99. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. It's like 99% occupied right. at the mineral uh -huh. closing line. Right, and, and, and they're all in the mid to upper I've, it's been a couple of weeks since I've read it, but they're all, they're all at capacity. I think the other thing would be to ask ourselves, what is District 1, what are they saying these days? Are they parking in the neighborhood? And are they Probably. complaining? And, so. yeah. I, I sometimes park in the neighborhood after I drop my daughter off at school and I walk mm -hmm. four blocks, four, uh, about a quarter mile or so, quarter to half a mile. After I drop her off. From Englewood? Okay. From, uh, I, I take the Louisiana Pearl. So uh. mm, yeah. Yeah. They have parking. Denver has parking restrictions in that neighborhood as they do in yeah, several other right. parking stations. Uh, to make typical people like me walk, walk, mm -hmm. walk, walk for the yeah. yeah. That's a typical urban walk to light rail, right? Most <laughs> people don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> they should be able to park and just yes. walk right on the train. And walk onto the platform. <laughs> yeah. I know people who walk 15 minutes to get to their train to go to work. But Thank not you. In Denver. Mm -hmm. right? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add on to Council Member Olson's comment about the parking. I think our biggest concern right now is from our industrial area, which is on uh, Windermere, essentially. 
uh, that location between Oxford and, and Hamden, we've had a number of complaints about encroachment into the industrial area where those employers have a difficult time with parking their, their employees. employees. So what was intended, I think, to believe to be a kiss and ride where you drop somebody off is now basically parking on the streets as well as parking on Mansfield and, and into Calumet and, that, and those streets. So I know that's a big concern in our parking enforcement person. We have one, he's very busy, um, struggles, with, struggles with that. That's the Sheridan station, of course. I think yeah, yeah, that's Lawton Station. Right. Yeah. For each of those stations that uh, were effectively designed as kiss and rides, we have found that the more usage there is, yeah. there are people parking wherever they can around there and walking. And it ain't really a kiss and ride. <laughs> <laughs> right. They're driving their car along. Okay, thank you. Council Member Berentine. Oh, well, I appreciate you guys coming and presenting. I think you are representing us here. And, um, it was originally done as a kiss and ride with the additional passage of more the uh, money. We were uh, another fund increase that happened, and I think there's been three or four. We kept getting promised kind of more and more. And the original drawings that we saw from that was a uh, parking lot where Martin Plastics is, mm -hmm. was where Oxford Station and a bunch of apartments are now. So one of the presentations <coughs> we went to where <coughs> they were going to resolve the issue of the parking, they had a big circle drawn around Martin Plastics and Sam's Automotive, which is on the other side, and that's what that was supposed to be was parking. So I don't know what happened with that, but I would like to uh, find out. I don't think you're gonna tear down an apartment building now, but uh, that was the intent, was to go ahead and provide that <coughs> for some of that there. Um, that causes, like the need for Cushing Park, mm -hmm. is where that, um, on the north uh, side over here by Dartmouth, right. is an extension of the park. And I think Doug Cohen's here, he was very, you could, blame, you could partially blame him. He and his Boy Scout troop were very active in um, going down there and having that be part of, actually it turns out it's one of the only areas in Inglewood that was actually a, uh, considered an actual natural habitat piece and that would have covered that over and that was an extension of that park and so yes that neighborhood in district one sure. was not happy not about happy. it until you had a couple of engineers that knew what a core sample was and started coming and complaining before you guys started pouring anything into the holes you were making <laughs> so I realized that that failed but um, when the subsequent maps came out, you had some concern then down in District 4 area and District 3 where I'm at, where they were going, well, they're gonna take up all this parking too. And I don't know what ever <coughs> happened to it because you had all these circles drawn around everything about where your areas were and where parking was gonna be. And then all of a sudden it just kind of all went away and an apartment building went up, which hasn't exactly helped the traffic or the um, industrial area down there either because that's where those are built. So if you could kind of lead us through at some point in the next time you present of what happened with that. And um, they all seem to be tied to, just like the bait station originally, mm -hmm. seemed to be, we get people come and talk to us a lot when they want some money or they're gonna do a tax increase. So, and we, we haven't exactly done too well in the tax increase part of it, getting what, kind of what was promised during that piece of it. It keeps getting pushed out, so if we could get an update on that. Also, I would like to see the original agreement for this council to just kind of update us again. I believe it was 400, mid 400 parking spaces. And every time RTD comes, I'm starting to hear it at a lower number. So either I missed something and we It'll be 250 did. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in Vegas here. We're not, so I believed it was another 450 spaces. Now, I may have that number stuck in my head from the Dartmouth, right. um, from the Cushing Park mm -hmm. issue where they were trying to do some of them. They couldn't have done, they couldn't have even come <clears> close <throat> to all of them because they were just doing flat um, asphalting there, so that wouldn't have been that many spaces. But they were trying to relieve some of that number 
So unless some of that number has been relieved, I'd like to go back and find out what the original agreement was. And because um, I, I don't, I still have, think it's 450 something around there. It's in the 400s. And I, otherwise, we got to stop asking you guys to come if the number keeps coming down. Or new councils get elected and new board members get elected, and maybe the rhetoric just keeps getting set and then I know, forget. And, and I apologize because. I very easily could be misspeaking. And I don't, and I don't know either. As long as I've been on for eight years. So if this is from back, we should find out. Yeah, I'll look. Okay. I'll look it up. And that may be just because people listen to what you guys say and then they go, well. But I believe right. from the Cushion Park thing. So we have it written down. I mean, so uh -huh. I'm pretty sure it's, it doesn't have to be like a tale we tell around the campfire. I mean, it's actually written down somewhere so we can figure this out. And then we can kind of make a decision from there where we're where we're coming to and if we could get those previous maps on what you guys were considering the transit oriented districts because they were pretty extensive and so I just wanted to see where we were at with that and if that's changed why it did and if it didn't then where we're at with it. Thanks. Thank you. Really. And, and, and I know that uh, I can have discussions with Director Bagley about it too and I think between or among Director Bagley and Director Walker and me. I thought you said he was the previous one. Is he still on the board? No, but he's got a welcome. He was here for so many years. Oh, he okay. You're just calling him years. Director Bagley out of his respect for his right. previous position. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Because he was there for eight years and he did a lot of study oh. mm -hmm. on this and other things. So uh, I do periodically pick his brain. Yeah, I was at a presentation he did in Littleton <coughs> a couple months ago. I know he's still very active. I just wanted yeah. the clarification. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much um, for coming to present to us. Is this summary report that you shared with us, is that available? Yes, for I'll us? get that to Darren. Is that easiest or to who, or to Eric? Yeah, that, either one's fine. Okay. We'll make sure we disseminate that to council. I'll get it to you so that you can disseminate it. Okay. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you very much uh, for coming to share with us, and uh, it's always good to hear from you. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. We appreciate if you, it. If you ever want to catch crawdads, you and Doug can go down to we that go area. Right down <laughs> <in> that. <laughs> Thank you. I, what we'll do, um, I think we'll go ahead and take a, a five minute break and then um, we can just move forward on the next agenda item. <clears throat>
Yeah, I was waiting to see if uh, you'd notice that. Oh, yeah. I'm OCD. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh. Yeah, he does. His review's coming up. His coming up. Fine. Good evening. Uh, I call this meeting back to order. Uh, and so um, Mr. Wolf is here to help us go over uh, council policies and procedures. And um, actually, I'm looking forward to this this evening because I'm hoping that we will make some significant progress. Great. <laughs> Me too. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, we will try to get through as much as we can. Uh, so this evening uh, we're asking a few things um, one is if you notice in the materials this evening they're a bit uh, different than the presentation that uh, has consistently been on your agenda the material is the same except there's uh, we reordered uh, starting with Bob's rules of order the rules of procedures uh, we also added a few extra slides. Uh, some of the questions came up uh, mirroring what we've covered in the board and commission training. I know several of you were there that evening. So ideally, we would get through the procedure manual since it is a little bit more straightforward. I know with the policies, there's more nuance and debate on how you want to approach uh, some of the new uh, policies. So the thought was to go through the procedure manual uh, this evening, Bob's Rules of Order, uh, first, uh, get some direction on perhaps bring forward uh, the ordinance uh, for initial review uh, and then move on to policies. Uh, certainly can do it either way. I'm prepared for both discussions, but that's the order you see in your packets is starting with uh, some highlights on Bob's rules of order. So can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, I want to ask this question of council um, because part of the reason we vacated um, a lot of the the things that were on the agenda was to finish up some of the things in the policy manual earlier in the evening rather than waiting till later. And so we can either begin to talk about some of those policies that we still have remaining or we can go ahead and do the, um, uh, the procedure manual first. 
Um, my concern has been, you know, there's a couple of things that I think we'll have some discussion on in the, in the policy manual itself, and so I kind of wanted to do that earlier rather than later. But can I just get some feedback from, from you all about the direction you would like to go? Thank you. So I believe if we if we choose to start with the procedures, the the op opportunity is to get to completion with some piece of the overall discussion. Whereas if we begin with the policy, we the discussion may be prolonged. Is, is um, that actually, I think that we. Um, we still have a couple of hours. I think we may get through all of it tonight either way. I would like us to, to, to do our best to get through all of this this that's, evening. That's the plan. Even but if I it means removing to something else from the agenda, which we've done sometimes. So mm -hmm. with that said, I don't really mind what I, I would prefer probably to continue po the policies section, but I don't, I don't have a very strong leaning to, to, to that direction. Um, I just want us to get through the whole of it tonight. Okay. I mean, that's um, <coughs> council member question. Uh, and, and I don't have a preference either way, especially if we're really, you know, I mean, we'll see how it goes. But I'm happy to try and really get through it tonight. And so, yeah, <coughs> I'm willing to bear down and really go for it tonight. Yeah. Okay, since there is, um, we can just go ahead with the way you planned, um, and then we'll just move forward from there. Okay, great. Uh, hopefully Bob's rules doesn't take us too long and we can get right into the, some of the meat. Uh, so starting uh, with uh, Bob's rules of order, uh, just a few things to highlight since it's been some time since we spent uh, time with Bob himself. Um, Mr. Widener on, on his rules of order. Uh, they are simplified rules based on uh, Robert's rules of order. Uh, we have encouraged all boards and commissions to adopt these standard rules. Um, we think hopefully that uh, it's a simpler guide to, to run a meeting. And some boards and commissions, as you know, um, won't ever need uh, a more formal way to run a meeting. But for those that do have controversial, controversial issues come up, especially for our quasi-judicial uh, bodies, uh, we've given them some, them some guidance on, on the board commission training. And I uh, appreciate a number of you were at that uh, training. And we've received uh, positive feedback from some of our boards and commissioners as, as well. So hopefully that, that helped. And, Again, we think this can help you as, as it helps the boards and commissions uh, organize meetings. Uh, the, one of the main uh, distinctions here is that uh, the chairperson is the parliamentarian. So in this case, the mayor pro temp or the mayor will be your, uh, your expert. So there won't be a need to tap into the city attorney or have a parliamentarian that's identified outside that, uh, in essence, you as a body uh, electing your chairperson uh, you're also giving that person authority to to maintain control uh, over over the meetings. Now, this chairperson uh, can waive rules at any any time, but that is subject to the will of the body. So, there's again, you're in casual conversation, and there's a need to waive a rule, so be it. But if some member wants to go back to your procedure manual, then uh, that point of order can be raised, and we'll get into a little bit of that. Though I won't do the example from the boards and commissions training meeting. <laughs> as much as it is entertaining for me. Uh, basic uh, requirements. Uh, all members need uh, recognition uh, for the floor. That is something you already do. Uh, no side discussions. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, voting is yes or no. There are no abstentions. Now, I say that with a big caveat that we need your guidance on how to deal with abstentions in Bob's Rules of Order. The current procedure manual doesn't outline uh, anything to do with abstentions other than abstentions count as a no vote and we'll get into a little bit more specifically some of the concern uh, related to that and lastly there's no explaining your vote during uh, except during your del deliberations so there's no need to either go around the table not um, not important for you at study session since you don't make decisions but certainly on the dais uh, you explain your vote before you make the vote and that already happens all right, so getting into some of the details on Bob's Rules of Order, uh, in, in case you do move this forward, just so everybody is familiar with 
uh, the language here. I encourage you to make sure you study that procedure manual so that uh, you know these different actions when the time comes. But there are three different uh, types of motions. So that I'm going to explain a little bit the difference between motions and, and points. Uh, you use both of them a bit already, so it shouldn't be too foreign. Uh, motions must have a second, so that's the distinction from, from points. Uh, there's three different types, uh, privileged, uh, main, and subordinate, and they are handled in that order, privileged, main, then subordinate. Uh, points uh, are privileged motions, so that's the easiest way to think of, about them is the, they must be taken up uh, immediately in that order. So if somebody raises any of those four points, and as you remember, uh, the point of decorum is one uh, that our, our city attorney added to Bob's Rules of Order, again, just to give you another mechanism uh, to help with uh, running meetings. A uh, little bit more details on, on points and motions. Uh, they must be dealt with in that priority order. All points are privileged. Motions to recess and motions to enter executive session are all privileged. So if one of those two motions are made uh, or any of those four points are raised, uh, you must deal with that first, uh, no matter what is, is on the, the floor at the time. Uh, there are 10 different types of main motions. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about that on the next page. And then subordinate motions to your main motion are your motions to amend, uh, continue to a date certain, or call the question to end debate. Uh, here's a list of your main motions. Uh, the main motion, that is anything that you can imagine. So you have a resolution in front of you, <coughs> the, the motion to approve the resolution, that's your, that's your main motion. Uh, it could certainly be any number of different topics based on what uh, agenda item you, you are considering. Uh, main motion could be add something to the agenda for next meeting, whatever that might be. It could be a variety of different topics. But point being, uh, your main motion really is, is the heart of the actions in a meeting. Uh, motion to recess, uh, that is a privilege. And I just mark them by first, second, third. So first, your privileged motion. Second, your main motions. And third, your subordinate. Uh, we went through recess and executive session. Motion to adjourn is a main motion. Uh, same with uh, motion to reconsider. Uh, you do have to be on the prevailing side in order to make a motion to reconsider. So one of the probably the most complicated in Bob's Rules of Order, but definitely simpler than uh, uh, Robert's Rules of Order in, in reconsideration. Uh, motion to postpone to a, a date certain is a main motion. Uh, postpone indefinitely as well. And then on the right side are your um, subordinate motions. Uh, motion to amend, motion to continue to a date certain, and motion to call the question. Probably. Uh, one of the, the biggest departures from Robert's Rules of Order is there's not as much uh, building on actions, if you mm. will, uh, as there is allowed in, in Robert's Rules of Order. So what I mean by that is that you cannot have multiple motions to amend on the floor at any time. So if there's a main motion, motion to approve the ordinance, let's say, uh, then some, one of the other members says, I'd like to make a motion to amend then you must deal with that amendment to, to the, the ordinance, the main motion, before somebody else comes in and tries to change the language. Uh, so again, sometimes it, it could bog you down, but it makes it easier instead of trying to figure out, well, wait, what was that first amendment? Did, are we amending the amendment? Are we on the main motion now? You get rid of all that. You just have your main motion, your motion to amend, deal with the amendment, and then you're back to the main motion. And then another amendment can come in after that, but you're always keeping one on the floor. Can you take questions? Yeah, absolutely. Councilmember Olson. So I, I'm not sure we've done this correctly. Have you seen us do it incorrectly sometimes like this? Which which part? The, the amending <laughs> and, and having several amendments or an amendment to an amendment. Is it best to withdraw the amendment if someone says, well, I think we should do this instead? And then would the first person withdraw, or do we just go, have to go ahead and vote on it? Yeah, and I'm, this is what I did for the board and commission training is look over to the city attorney to make sure that I answer <laughs> these questions correctly. Uh, so one of the distinctions is that with a motion, it's, it's your motion instead of the body's motion in Robert's Rules of Order. So you, you can withdraw your motion. Uh, same thing with, a, with an amendment. Uh, you can also have friendly amendments, uh, but that must be done before there's an amendment on the floor. Otherwise, as soon as an, a motion to amend is made and seconded, then you have to take up that, that amendment first, that motion. And I have, didn't we, see it. 
probably move too quickly on some of those sometimes in the past. We've had them seconded and <coughs> talked about it before. And we've done yeah, and we, we started um, preparing for Bob's Rules of Order at the staff level, knowing we, we were going to go to our boards and commissions and hopefully eventually with the city council. So uh, our city clerk's office is trained in this as well. And so if you kind of hear somebody, Jackie or Stephanie, chiming in saying, what was that? Yeah. yeah, that's what we're trying to do is just make sure mm -hmm. we, we can get the action. And again, with, with this process, it's a lot easier to keep track of who made the motion, what, what are we changing, in, in, especially as you start getting into to ordinances and changing words on, on the fly and that Great, type thank of stuff. You. Councilmember Brandon. On the motion to amend, you you kind of just as an example in here, gone ahead and taken this piece of it and said this is the type. But if I just look at the motion to amend, I think some people are having a hard time hearing. Yes. She can move that mic down. Move the that mic. mic. I'm sorry. 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 Thanks. Can you hear me better? Yes. I'll speak up. Um. I don't see in here where it's, you made the comment where you didn't want more than one amendment at a time on here, but I'm, I don't see that in here. So how are we using this if we are, I don't see that in here. Could you show in me the, where? In the procedure it's, manual. It, yeah. If you give me a moment, I can. So, I mean, I, I kind of see, um, and for the city attorney too, this uh, PowerPoint piece is kind of um, um, explanation or um, kind of the interpretation of what you believe is going on within these rules, but I'm not necessarily seeing that with some of these. Are we going to make sure that each of these PowerPoint issues that you're bringing up, that we could get uh, tie in to know exactly where that is so that we're not thinking we're passing one thing with this and then this says something else. If somebody sure. goes into this and says, wait a second, we didn't pass something that said you couldn't have more than one motion. And that's happened numerous <coughs> times with I think every council that I've ever sat in <coughs> for the last 20 years where maybe it might be necessary in order for it to be properly amended more than one thing may have to be amended. So that's just why that caught my attention. But looking through this. Point of information, I'm, I'm completely confused about what's being said. Okay. The PowerPoint? Um, power, from, we have a PowerPoint on the wall. Is, is there yes, a that particular PowerPoint And the PowerPoint bullet? that's in your, oh, okay, go ahead. Perhaps I could just clarify the, the motion to amend first and uh, just on, on that. I, I've tried to be careful about trying not to So uh, for represent. her point of information, I'd like to go ahead and clarify my sure. question. So um, the information that's being put here that we're discussing is not the body of what, we're, what this says. We are discussing and making decisions kind of on what we want to see from this PowerPoint. But when I go to the meat of it, and I use that as an example, that is not what I see that it says there. So you're saying what's here in Bob's rules within motion to amend, all of these details don't correspond with what's being discussed as our proposed policy? Right, so when he makes the, I wanna make sure that we just tie in um, the, um, the, the PowerPoint piece of it so that we know that it's actually what's what we're going to be passing right. so that we've got that tie in there. So I just want to try yeah, to make that uh, a little easier. On the motion to amend. And Did that clear up your question a little better? I or? think so. Thank you. Okay. Okay. On, the, on the motion to amend, and I have tried, if there is something that I have indicated that isn't uh, explicit in Bob's Rules of Order, then absolutely. I'm not uh, trying to add things. If there's something that needs to be clarified in the <coughs> procedure manual, then absolutely we need to do it. I don't think you're trying to add it. I yeah. just think there's kind of an interpretive piece of no, it I, maybe I between it. the PowerPoint and the thing, and I'm just trying to make sure we mesh them together. For the for the clarification on the motion to amend, on page 14 in your uh, Council Rules of Procedure draft, uh, under motion to amend, uh, in that paragraph, it, it describes what I was talking about there, that the 
Uh, a motion to amend is not in order when another motion to amend is already pending, made and seconded before the body. Um, example, the body will deal with only <coughs> one motion to amend at a time to avoid confusion. So that's what I was referring to specifically to a motion to amend, that if there is a recognized motion and second motion to amend on the floor, then the body will deal with that first as opposed to... Not that you can't make more than one, uh, one amendment to the motion. Co correct. Okay, so, so it's just the way that it's being... Okay, that's, yeah, yeah, perhaps that's important. Misspoke. Okay, thank so you. So you can, you can have a motion to amend, vote it down, and you still have the main motion to, let's say, approve an ordinance in front of you, and mm -hmm. another amendment could come in. That wouldn't necessarily mean that a motion to amend wouldn't be two-parted or something, but just that you're saying they would be kept separate. Yep. That clarifies it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, can I ask a question then also? So if you have one motion to amend and a second, and then that gets approved, but then there's another amendment, can you then have another motion to amend before you go back to the original motion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yep, and I think for for the, the mayor, the mayor pro tem running the meeting, it, it just is helpful when you realize that's happening to clarify. We have a, a amendment was, a, was approved by the body. We have the main motion uh, as amended now. Uh, are there any additional motions to amend at that point? So you, you documenting the actions as you go through through the meeting. But absolutely, it's just making sure there's not two or three different amendments at one time and the body is confused as to what amendment they're discussing. <coughs> okay. so unlimited amendments, just one at a time. All right, thank you. <coughs> All right, any additional questions on these various different... I, and again, I encourage you to read through the, the whole manual. I didn't detail every single action for instance, motion to uh, call the question, uh, close the, the debate, requires two-thirds majority. So there, there's some small nuances in there that I haven't gone over specifically, but um, I have tried not to add anything to it. My, my only concern is that I don't want necessarily this to become what gets used because it's easier and bullet right. pointed. Correct. <laughs> but maybe not. Yeah, and, and then it keeps getting watered down. And the, the one we will provide that that should help the body that is not produced by me, which is nice. It's produced by <laughs> Bob uh, Widener himself. Yeah, is end. this mm -hmm. uh, chart at the very end uh, that we'll make laminated that helps you um, understand which motions and points are privileged and in what order to take something up, whether or not something requires two thirds majority or just a simple majority. So hopefully that will help provide some clarity as well. That was all that I had. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. So just yeah. Councilmember Olson. <laughs> um, this is all following in the order of the policy and procedures manual, right? With the, I mean, the, with this. This is just an outline of it. So if we just keep looking at this, mm. I, this meaning what the hard copy is, <laughs> yeah, you're we'll green. be able to look at it and see if it's in line, right? It should be. I mean, Correct. These, these are not out of order from the way it's written in the policy manual is what I'm asking. Okay. Right. I tried to stay in, in okay. some logical order I'm going to just keep looking at that part because I need to think we're going to make sure that they are the same. The exception is the next two okay. slides. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Be because it is not. It's exactly uh, the session on the next note. <clears throat> right. So, so as I mentioned at the outset, abstentions are, are not uh, covered. Well, I shouldn't say that. Under Bob's rules of order, abstentions count as a no vote. And so as we were uh, discussing this internally and was brought up at the Boards and Commissions training, uh, as we were reflecting on it, if uh, the only situation in which you can uh, abstain uh, is if there's a conflict of interest. That's specifically outlined in Bob's Rules of Order. Well, because Bob's Rules of Order uh, says that a, uh, an abstention will be counted as a no vote, for somebody that is uh, announcing a conflict of interest or a perceived confl conflict of in interest, it allows that person to weigh in negatively on that matter. Whether they're intending to or not, that's how the rules read. And so we felt there was at least in need of some discussion, if not a clarification to Bob's rules of order. So uh, based on that, there's uh, three different options to perhaps remedy this. Uh, one is to just keep Bob's rules of order as written, knowing that if somebody raises a conflict of interest and abstains, their vote will be recorded as a, as a no vote and take that as it may. 
as long as the body is aware of it and agrees to it, that's one way to handle it. <clears throat> Another way to handle it is to count all abstentions with the majority. So however that uh, ends up working out, uh, whether it's a positive or a negative vote, you know that it will always be recorded as, uh, as with the majority, unless there is not a majority. And I think in that case, we'd suggest it just to be counted as a blank <coughs> vote at that. No? Yes. Wait for city attorney. <laughs> if there is mo no majority, what it means is there's a tie vote. A tie vote is always a failure. So uh, the, the abstention would go with the no side because the no wins on a tie vote. Thank you. Does, does all that make sense? It does, except number three it seems like it's the same as number one to me. But that's because you've missed one other reason to do an abstention. Maybe? So number three uh, is, is different in that it keeps Bob's Rules of Order in that if someone were to abstain without uh, conflict of interest uh, or an absence in the case of, let's say, voting for, for minutes, uh, that would be recorded as a no vote, which is how it is uh, now. Except that what we're saying is that because of the perceived uh, negative weighing in negatively to an issue that you've uh, raised a conflict of interest, the allowance would be for specifically for conflicts of interest to be recorded as a blank in this case. So you're clarifying that we're taking Bob's rules of order as it is, where if you abstain, it's a no vote, unless it's explicitly for a conflict of interest that you <coughs> raised to the body. Other than abstentions. <laughs> Yeah, I read it almost the same as number one because you wouldn't have any other reason. There is. No, okay. Count, um, Council Member Martinez, and, and okay. Yeah, I kind of have the same question. I thought the only reason to abstain was because of a conflict of interest, but you're saying that we have other <coughs> questions. Let's see. Thank After you. Bob's Rules of Order, just a second, I've got to pull it back up. I'm looking at a couple of documents. Under Bob's Rules of Order, you can abstain, it's a discretionary <coughs> abstention. Um, and a second, pulling up all the right documents. What it says is that there are two grounds for abstention. The first is a conflict of interest, which the chairman in the body, the chairperson in the body, can acknowledge, but you can't force a person who just declared a conflict of interest to vote. The second is. Uh, the chairperson is excused by, or the member is excused by the chairperson because the member is without sufficient information upon which to enable an informed vote due to an absence at a prior meeting. The example is specifically, if you don't attend a meeting, you don't vote on the minutes. You weren't there. You don't know what the perceptions were. You don't vote. So that's the example provided. If you weren't at a previous meeting, you don't know it's appropriate to abstain, and that's a discretionary abstention. Those could be recorded as a no vote, uh, with conflicts being a blank. I'd like to suggest there's a fourth option as well, and that's what you currently use under Robert's rules. Under Robert's rules, you currently count all abstentions as blanks. The reason that that's an issue is because there are questions about does that impact quorum? Mm -hmm. If somebody has recused themselves, they can't participate in the discussion, they can't participate in the vote, have they impacted quorum? And instead of getting into that issue, it, it's, I think it's easier to go with an abstention counts with the majority. And that way there's no question that there was a vote, the person was in the room, but they don't impact the vote, which if they get a note, if they're allowed to say, I'm declaring a conflict of interest, and their vote immediately becomes a no, they've impacted a vote where they have a conflict of interest, which I think is an issue. So I perceive that you have three options. One, leave it the way it is under Robert's rules. A conflict is always a blank, and then we deal with the quorum issue separately. Two, you let it be a no vote and you're aware that anyone has a conflict of interest is allowed to weigh in negatively, or three, abstentions always run with the majority. Thank you. Council Member Barentine. 
The, um, there's, there's two issues with this that when I was looking this up that the abstention is, um, I guess, under Robert's rule with that blank, um, the way that I read that is they're intending that that person doesn't exist there for that conversation. They're not there, which means they cannot speak to it. They cannot opine on it. They can't give their um, two cents into it or what's been going on. They're supposed to not be there for that discussion or the vote and that they're not counted. It's as if they are for that piece of it absent. Um, and I would agree with that. I don't think through the entire time that I've been on council or involved with council that that's ever happened. We've had people abstain for financial reasons. One was specifically the mayor for the, who worked for our sports authority. Yeah, and, thank you. Uh, didn't vote, but um, I mean, it's just kind of a, a habit that, well, you work for them, what are they doing, how is this working? And we had that same thing happen with the last abstention as well, where we went ahead and, and still had input from that person. And so we have to, we have to make sure that we're clear on, I mean, the vote piece of it is just the mere fact that he was mayor at the time probably had some influence on the other members. But um, that aside, um, I kind of would prefer to go with the um, what Robert's rules already have for it and try to be a little bit more diligent with our leadership to make sure that that person isn't brought into the conversation, especially after they've already said that they have a conflict. And I mean, it, it happens all the time. I'm not outing any particular issue that happened, but it got brought up to me afterwards, and I go, well, I, I see your point. I mean, I, I see the point that somebody, especially if they have a certain level of expertise or involvement in it, which is the exact reason that they're giving that up. So how we would deal with the, the having a quorum at the time is somewhat of an issue, though. <coughs> and especially when we're, we've got um, a missing a member right now, even though that's really in the grand scheme of things a very short period of time. Um, because I'm concerned about the other two still actually voting and understanding that especially if something's controversial and they know that that's, I don't know, it still, it still seems like it's just not a, an appropriate way to handle it because it still ends up being a vote on there. So that's my two cents on it. I, I would prefer that we stick with the way Robert's Rules has it right now and just make Which sure Which means that all that's abstentions are counted as blanks. Th that, well, the way it says it is that they're absent. I mean, abstention is that they, they're absent. They're not there no for that piece of okay. it. Okay, thank you, Council Member Wilson. Where do, you th where do you think, I mean, I, I've seen this happen in the last year, year and a half, maybe a little bit longer, where I tried to abstain on something, but the council voted against, uh, council voted on whether I could abstain or not. And that happened to me mm -hmm. twice, and they would not let me abstain. And I thought there was a financial gain one way or the other on this, so I did not want to vote. And I've encouraged others in past councils, not this one, to, to do the same because I thought it was unethical for them to be voting on stuff. So where does the council get to rule it and how do we get so off, off on that one? Did that come from Robert's rules? or That did not come from Robert's rules. I'm not sure where that came from. For the conflict of interest rules, I went back to state statute. And as you all know, if it's if your charter says that if it's an issue that's not covered by the charter, you revert back to state statute. And state statute says that if there's a conflict of interest, you shall not vote. And the decision is the me is the members, mm -hmm. because if you vote the individual, the individual yeah, members plural, <laughs> right? Because the penalty for voting when you have a, con a fiduciary conflict of interest is to be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. That's very individual to you. So because the impact is specific to the member, the member has the right to say, I believe I have a conflict of interest. The rest of the council, I, the way I read state statute, the rest of the council has to respect that for fiduciary fiscal conflicts of interest. And I also have to be careful because I'm using fiduciary in the legal sense and I know that accountants and others use it in a, in a slightly different sense. But 
Can I ask for a point of information then? Um, did at the time that that either one of these incidents happened, was that prior to our current council being present? Yes, it was the council and, and, just before this one. Mm -hmm. And it was um, it was the council before this one, mm -hmm. as in this Not last this current one. So I think we need to make it really clear that because there's enough of us here that that remember. Mm -hmm. well, well, obviously I don't, or I wouldn't be asking. Well, I mean, so maybe, but there has been oh, okay. for eight years. That's how how it was done. Okay. So um, because I've seen, I mean, it was, it's been pretty consistent that any time something like that happened, council was asked. So was council asked at that time whether council could vote on it or not? Because I've seen very little happen on that dais where council wasn't. Uh, um, uh, at least ask their opinion. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that happen where council wasn't asked. So, if it, do you think that you just weren't given good counsel on it, or Different council point. wasn't told the right way, or I'm not sure why you. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, I think that the mayors at the time, the mayor at the time, thought that we had to ask permission of everyone to vote from the council. Yeah. Nobody interrupted. Right. It was not with this. Now, pre previous council did not speak to uh, Councilmember Olson's abstention. They allowed the mayor to say, "No, we have to have a vote to see if she can." Does abstain. that come from the charter? There must have been uh, something. I, no, council policy. Let's it, not worry about it. Let's just oh, it was it's, it's, no. Well, it came from somewhere, and I just want to know where it's coming from. It's, in either way. There's okay. a vague statement within the city policy manual, but. Oh. I don't interpret the city policy manual to be in conflict with state law. I think because it's written vaguely, it's just been interpreted in a vague manner. But because state statute's very clear what the penalty is and it's personal to you, I think it's really important for me to make it clear you have authority to protect yourselves regarding conflicts of interest. And if you think you have a conflict of interest, it is imperative that you declare it. And nobody gets to gainsay that. Frankly, I mean, in the eight years before, I'd only seen abstentions when someone hadn't listened to the meetings and they abstained on voting for the minutes. And But I did have a time where I thought and uh, was voted against. Mm -hmm. And so it was really great, I thought, last week that we could have a council <coughs> member say they had a conflict of interest and we just accepted it and went on. I'm like, whoa, great. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, were we supposed to meet? <laughs> were we supposed to vote on that? So, so, so that conflict's been taken out. Our, our, if our policy was in conflict with state law, that's No, right. no. Our policy, in my opinion, does the way it currently is written does not conflict with state law. It was just written in a rather vague manner, okay. and so I think it was just badly interpreted. Thank you for the clarification. I appreciate it. So were you done, Councilmember Olson? Yep. We're, okay. Thank you. Um, so do you want us to weigh in what we want to do with abstentions? Yeah, we'll need some guidance uh, from this council in order to reflect that in the procedure manual that would be brought forth. Okay, thank you. Council Member Martinez. Uh, I prefer either option two or three. Either they're recorded with the majority or their um, conflict of interests are not counted as no, would, would be counted as absent. Okay. Councilmember Wink. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the option uh, where the uh, the abstention does not does not affect the total outcome of the votes present. Okay, which would be three or four. The, I think when it doesn't impact the total would be either to be a blank or to be with the majority. So the blank is kind of what I'm thinking. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Cuesta or Olson? I, I'm going to go with the blank as well, uh, and because I don't think anybody would be in intention, but you could then still mm -hmm. impact your vote mm -hmm. by abstaining and knowing you're going to go into the no. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so I would go with blank as well I think, in this case. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, Councilmember Olson? I, I like three, and uh, as long as the member who will still count towards quorum, I think that protects it. So. I'll add in some language about quorum. Yeah. Okay, okay. Councilmember Berntine? I like four, but okay. I'm okay with three. Okay, and I I like um, I want it to be a blank as well. Um, 
I'm not sure about the quorum. I mean, how, if there ends up being only five people, um, can you address that? Yes, Mayor, I can. <laughs> so, if, and I'm hearing a consensus for number three. So, as I would write the ordinance, it would include uh, an exception with Bob's rules modifying it to reflect the language of number three. There would be a, another subsection that would state that a member declaring a conflict of interest in regard to a matter pending before the body and thereafter abstaining from the discussion and vote does not change quorum for the purposes of establishing a valid meeting of the body. So we just recognize right then they are still in the room, quorum still exists. And third, if after a member declares a conflict of interest, the remaining members of the body eligible to act upon the matter do not equal a quorum, the matter should be tabled to the next regular meeting at which a quorum of members is available to decide the matter unless immediate action is necessary and proper. This rule should be construed to weigh against allowing less than a quorum of the membership to act upon a member before the body, a, a matter before the body. But it gives you a little flexibility if you've got an emergency matter before you. So now what if someone has a conflict of interest um, and it requires a supermajority and there's only five people? Then it would have to be tabled? Okay. A supermajority would still allow the less one person not to participate. Okay. So is there consensus to move forward with um, how the city attorney just read it? Council Member Martinez. I'm um, in favor of that. And I also say, um, I'm asking, should we continue to abstain if we are absent a meeting for approving the minutes? I would okay. think so. Even if you've listened to it? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Does that Thank answer you. that question? Yes. Okay. We got job. some direction. That, that, <laughs> bring, that brings you to the end of the rules of proceeding presentation. Uh, so next steps, uh, again, as a reminder, uh, your rules of procedure require that uh, council adopt an ordinance to, to adopt those uh, rules of procedure. So uh, if you are prepared to do so, uh, we will be working diligently to bring forth that, that ordinance for, for first reading. reading. We uh, believe we can make this happen uh, at your March 19th meeting. Good. Great. Do it. Thanks. Council Member Brandheim. I mean, this is, I mean, it's for both of you. I mean, I have a concern with the way that the format is for this. I mean, the, the way that this is presented is somebody <coughs> else's training material. And, and when we pass this um, as an ordinance, how are we, you know, let me make sure that. Yeah, that's a discussion actually the mayor and I have had. Uh, and what I'm going to do as I write the ordinance, and again, I'll bring, I'll bring it back and you can review it, make sure that it, it works for you. But the language that is not specific, I cut a lot of training material out. I just left some in because I needed you to have that information for this discussion. So the language that is not specific to Bob's Rules of Order, I don't intend to include in the document the ordinance that you uh, receive next week. If there is language that is clarifying, uh, and there's a couple places that the mayor was pointing out to me, this is really helpful information, but it's not really part of Bob's rules. We'll just include a reference that that, that information is included for reference purposes only. So basically we'll, we'll do that cleanup as part of the ordinance drafting. Okay, and maybe take all of his, like his name off of mm -hmm. the ordinance is going to have. Robert Wagner on that because he'll charge us for that. One well, and, and actually you're making a joke about that, but I did reach out and I'm tell. I'm not joking. Yeah, I <laughs> did reach out and have a conversation with him about this, and I said, I would like to use your Bob's Rules of Order, but I would like to amend it because there's some sections of it that I don't think are, are applicable to, to my city. And he said, carte blanche. So we're not being charged and we're allowed to amend it. And we're going to keep well, calling it. Well, it's not going to be in this format with his name or any of the sub stuff. It's going to be re rewriting. Right. Uh, on this piece of it, um, are we, how, do we just, we vote twice on this ordinance? Mm -hmm. 
okay, because uh, I am concerned that I would like to see it in its completed stage prior to, uh, so that we can have some discussion prior to us voting on it. And I guess that will depend on what we do in our policy about whether we can vote on something when it is in study session. I suppose that'll matter. Because if we can't do it next time in order to have some discussion and make sure that we're taking a look at it in its finished form, I would want one opportunity to see it in that format before we vote. Absolutely. I, I intend to put a draft ordinance together. The mayor actually, and I visited about this a couple of weeks ago, so I'm, I'm pretty ready to go with this. Uh, I'll have a draft ordinance ready for you to look at. If it's not in the form that you want, you have the same options you have with any ordinance. You can table it to a future meeting to have certain changes and corrections brought back to you. Um, if that they're just a few small things, you can actually adopt the ordinance with the following amendments, changes, and concerns. So, y yeah, you're not losing any of your flexibility to act on this ordinance. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Olson. This one. Oh, <laughs> yes. The giving credit to Robert Widener, um, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> As someone who used to deal with this all the time in plagiarism, it would seem to me that we do need to have his name in, unless he's made a very specific statement. This is now open access. Everyone can use it verbatim in whatever segment you want, but any three words or a paragraph that we take that he has written, we have got to give acknowledgement for by law. Yes. Although, his, his, he's got a couple of places in there where um, cities using it, he gives, basically, while it's not open access, it is as close as he can make it. He just doesn't want people running off with it and changing it. We won't change the name. We won't change that he was the developer. This, this sections that Councilmember Barentine was specifically referring to is just running the byline with his name on every page and all of that. And, and yes. Not be right. Right, but we'll, we will leave all the sections in that show that he is the original author. Okay, great. Thanks. Any other questions at this point? Um, I do, and we talked about this a little bit, about, <clears throat> you know, you have put that it's, you know, the policies or procedures are not law, but once we vote on this, it is law. Mm -hmm. For, for your rules of procedure, yes. Procedures are adopted. Your charter requires your procedures be adopted by ordinance, which does make them law. They won't go into the code. If after you've worked with them for a few months, you discover there's an issue, you tell me there's an issue, and I bring back an ordinance to amend them. If it doesn't work, you get to fix it. These are your procedures. The policy manual is not adopted as law. It's policies and you'll just be adopting that by motion. <coughs> Thank you. Councilmember Berentine. Um, I appreciate that you said that if it's not working that we could just change it. But there's a process for putting it into place then there's a process for changing it. And so I would like that to be a little bit more upfront about what, I mean we can't just change it. We can't just be up there and go I don't really like this right now and change it, it's, the, it, it's law. And so there's a process for putting a law into place. There's a process for changing it. So what would the process for changing anything that we don't like be? Exactly what you're doing this evening. Mm -hmm. uh, as a group, you'll come to consensus and you'll direct me to bring back an ordinance with a modification. So the only way we can change this is through another ordinance, is Correct. to pass another ordinance. I do want to add that Bob's rules does provide you flexibility meeting to meeting at the chairperson's discretion. So for some, yeah, for some. So you do have some flexibility if you want to waive a particular rule for the evening for the discussion or what have you. You, you still have that flexibility. You don't have to go through the ordinance change process. And just for another um, clarification, as to this point in the city, none of these procedures have ever been done by ordinance. <coughs> That's absolutely true as far as I can tell. Okay. Um, the only reason I'm suggesting ordinance is because the charter says your procedures must be adopted by ordinance. Well, they just didn't follow through with Part B. <laughs> <laughs>
But I just wanted to make sure that, I mean, aside from the flexibility we have within it, that once it becomes law, then it's the law, and there's a procedure and change in the law, and that's the way that has to be. <coughs> okay, thank you. So now we're ready to move on to policies. policies. I'm wondering, do we need another bio break before we start on this, or just want to move forward for right now? Do you mind if I've had too much water? <laughs> All right, we'll take a five minute bio break.
call the meeting back to order. Thank you very much. Moving right along in your policy manual. Uh, reminder of where we're at. Uh, we are, I just took out the slides that we haven't gotten to yet. So I'm, they're not pink packets, the ones that we've already covered. Uh, this uh, section is a continuation of proposed new policies that are currently addressed in your draft manual. Uh, I have boiled three uh, complicated issues into three bullet points. So uh, those are the three items for, for you to consider. I'll go, go through those. Uh, the next section we'll get into are items that are not addressed in, in your draft manual. So starting here, these are items that you can find in your draft uh, manual, starting with the use of council discretionary funds. Uh, there's a few clarifications in here, again, with the $600 per council member. Uh, one of the highlights is uh, a suggestion that uh, no council mailings uh, will occur uh, 90 days prior to a council uh, election. So just trying to prevent any uh, appearances of, of utilizing city funds for, uh, for constituent mailings during election. Uh, there's also uh, a few uh, clarifications in the policy manual as well on the, the total use and the ability of the, of the council to uh, allow for certain expenditures, uh, et cetera. Uh, the second uh, item is uh, council vacancies, establishing a uh, memorializing your process, basically, for in the event there were to ever be another vacancy on council. Um, one of those features is that, that if you have more than one vacancy at any one time, God forbid, uh, that that automatically trigger, triggers uh, uh, scheduling a special election. Uh, but for the most part, the suggested process in the policy manual is uh, what you have been trying to follow uh, this time around, uh, obviously including the provisions that are in charter already. And lastly, uh, telephonic participation. Uh, this proposed uh, policy provides uh, your guidelines for participation, uh, outlines it for occasional use uh, only uh, one time per year, uh, and a procedure for uh, notifying council and the public of that participation. Uh, it explicitly prohibits telephonic participation at quasi-judicial or executive functions for, for your quasi-judicial or executive functions. Uh, and again, it must be requested in advance three days in advance. So do you want feedback on these three areas right yes. now? Can we Be go into that or? Correct. Because they're, they're proposed new policies, we'll need an up or down or an amendment to, to these three items to make sure that uh, we're capturing what you want to do in these three areas. <coughs> Thank you. Council Member Cuesta. Uh, would you care to discuss each one individually? As yeah, that'd be helpful to start room. with uh, the discretionary fund. Um, you bet. I'm happy to jump in. Um, yes. Go ahead. Uh, on council discretionary funds, the first one that jumps out of me is letter E, which does allow for the purchase of alcoholic beverages with the city council members' um, discretionary fund. I think that is entirely objectionable. I don't think that the taxpayer should ever pay a cent for uh, uh, council members' drinks. And no, make no mistake, it's certainly the council members' uh, prerogative to secure the drink with a meal. But uh, I do not believe that the taxpayer should pick, pick that up at all. And then the second one is Q, uh, where members may request additional tangible support from the city manager behind, beyond that supply to other members to assist with effectively carrying out the duties of a city council member. It does leave a lot of discussion to city managers and where you draw that line. And uh, that one seems to me that, that it's tough to dictate who has oversight over that. At what point does it become objectionable? Uh, it, it's very, I think, subjective. Uh, Q and what defines tangible support uh, from the city manager. And those are the two that got Thank you. Um, any other? Um Member Olson. I, I agree with the uh, Councilman Member uh, Cuesta's thing on the alcohol. I was actually surprised to see it, and I think I had seen it before and was told that it, it didn't, that there had been a decision not to allow that, and maybe it just was wrong, because I've been always told that no, you cannot 
That's what I thought too. So I don't need something must have. But anyway, I'm glad we're cleaning it up. Okay. I'm fine with them. Great. Thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in on those or others? Councilmember Berntine. Um. Did this this section is all new, or there was pieces of this? Um, city manager. I mean, we've gone through so many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. M much of this section is, uh, is some of it is new for sure, uh, for certain. Um, so. I think let us know which ones are, are the new ones because there are some things that are in here from before. Yeah, I think as it's been enunciated before, the, the alcohol piece was is new. Um, I don't think that was in there before. That but we I'd can... Have, okay. I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the red line oh. version. No, yeah. it is not. Um, just to interfere. Sure. <laughs> That's your job. Good. Yeah. Dis, uh, how it currently reads is discretionary funds may be used for meals that are directly related to the responsibilities of the City Council. Expenditures for alcoholic beverages shall only be as part of a meal as opposed to separate expenditure. It's in there now. Okay. Where I, and you know that I, I'm the one who went through and, and made these changes. Where I could leave things untouched, I did. Because these are your choices to make, not mine. I certainly didn't add anything in about any kind of intoxicants at city's <laughs> expenditure. Mm -hmm. So we can certainly remove anything you want to remove. <clears throat> Council Member Berentine did that. Well, I was trying to um, remember which ones were totally new. And I would, um, I would agree with Council Member Cuesta and uh, Council Member Olson. I, I just had it in my head that we're not supposed to. I mean, probably it's it's it was never reality here, but because I've dealt with so many businesses and so many <coughs> trips, I just got so used to that. Maybe I just thought that was the rule. So I was a little surprised when I saw that too, but it never it doesn't bother me. I just thought that was the case. So um, I would agree, um, given the. Um, court decision last time that we uh, adopt what I believe is a state policy for 90 days prior to the election um, so that we avoid any impropriety or the appearance that somebody is electioneering on the city's dime either through the uh, newspaper through the Inglewood Citizen and we always did that I, I mean Previously, we no council member was allowed who was running for office to be in that prior to the election. Um, so when we did our scheduling out, so I don't know where that um, got off track. Of course, that mailing was a separate um, issue, but I, I think the 90 days is a good thing. I think there are a couple of things in here that start to um, and, and to um, Council Member Costa's point, I think there are a couple of things that start to border on and nothing with our current city manager uh, because I dealt with a previous city manager. And so we need to have a policy so that regardless of whether somebody is in favor with the city manager or in favor with the rest of council, that they are able to go ahead and do, make use of their funds in the same exact manner as every other council member without having to rely on the favor of council or the favor of a city manager. And so any time, as council member Cuesta has pointed out, that um, it's uh, kind of a subjective thing for anybody, I think you run the risk of that. Um, if um, Council Member Martinez has an issue and wishes to go ahead and use her discretionary funds and everybody else in this council disagrees with the issue you're doing but you want to go ahead and, and uh, put something out to your constituency because you believe that it's an important issue, you should be allowed to do that without us interfering with that. This is money that is supposed to be available so that people can go ahead and <coughs> do what they believe is their job from the people that elected them. Um, so I want to try and get away from anything that makes it somewhat subjective in the um, getting at funds. Um, for people that are well-heeled, 
well off, they want to go ahead and pay for any, everything themselves they can. But what we prohibit then is anybody who might be short of means, and there are certainly examples enough in the legislature of people who don't have a lot of money that they need to go ahead and they, and they do it out of a labor of love, so do people for counsel. So I want to make sure that we make that funding available so that it's for the purpose of them being able to do their job without them having to be at the, um, in favor with the majority of council or with the city manager. And so any of that kind of language as council member Quest has brought up, I would like to see out of, out of there. Okay, um, thank you. And I'm gonna weigh in uh, too on those, especially on those two on E and Q. I agree absolutely. Um, with what council member uh, Questa shared. Um, I also, I, I don't know, I have um, L, I, I put unnecessary, and that it conflicts with N. I, I think L and N are conflicting. Could you explain why you think they're conflicting? Um, because one is saying, I mean, I should, would like L to go away because I'm not sure that um, you can control a member's cost. So I'm not sure why we're policing my private funds. Right. So I, I'm just confused how there are conflict I don't agree with the one, but I'm not sure what the conflict you're talking about. Okay, and it could possibly, I just put it was unnecessary and I didn't want L, I really want L to go away. Um, What's wrong with N? I thought it was conflicting in part, uh, probably the last part of uh, L where it says, the member may request use of a telephone, fax machine or other device on an occasional basis to communicate directly with a constituent or to copy a document to be distributed to constituents the city manager shall direct that the cost of using such devices be charged against the member's discretionary balance. We don't have fax machines anymore. Right, but it, <laughs> <laughs> well, the fax machines, but um, then down and in it says council members may use their discretionary funds to pay the postage associated with mass mailing. Um, a mass mailing is an unsolicited mailing initiated by a member to his or her constituency. I suppose 25 or more. Hmm? at 25 or more. Yeah. So it sounds like what you could do is you could ask the manager to send 10 letters on your behalf if they're missed, right? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't see that it's directing him to do it. Well, it could be staff of any sort. Yeah. I'm just, or, I'm I, just, I thought yeah. it was you. <laughs> Me? You could do it. I can do it? You can do it. Put your own stamps on stuff. But I didn't think it was directing staff to ever do anything on behalf. We don't use stamps either. We use a franking machine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for diving into the details on that. But I would like, I would like that explained. Okay. Well, I mean, I, if there's consensus, we could make L go away. I mean, we do that on our own, really, anyway, don't we? So I have a question. Councilmember Wink. Um, at one of my, thank you, at one of my monthly meetings, a speaker was coming and um, made some final <clears throat> modifications to the presentation he was going to give at the very last minute. And um, he had four sets of handouts, m most, I think maybe three of which had multiple pages, front and back. And if, so for something like that, say we need, and I think there were tons of people who came to that meeting. Um, so if we get rid of L, which includes handouts that are to be shared with constituents, um, which is very different than a mass mailing okay. type of communication, then are, are you, 
It seems like the focus of N is mass mailing. It seems like L is covering just any costs that may be incurred by us throughout the variety of activities that we 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 partake in as okay. council members. All right, so I understand what you're saying now. Um, so this, and this I have underlined in red, generally the cost constituent of constituency communications are, are paid for by the member. If it is paid for by us, then what is the, so is the point that we could use discretionary funds, is that the point of L? that although normally they should be paid for by us, they could be. That's, that's the way I read that That's one. what I thought it meant. But I, none of us were around when that was written initially, so that's the difficult part. <coughs> yeah, I know. Um, so okay. whereas, to finish my point, okay, go ahead. had I gotten the files completed ahead of time, uh -huh. let's say I, I just print them at my house, Okay, but I didn't have that opportunity anymore, and maybe I run to a quick print place and use some of my funds. I mean, okay, is, you know, is that not an option? Okay, so, and how do we do that? Do we use our P card for discretionary funds? Yes, that's or you pay yourself and, and then submit a receipt and ask for reimbursement. I, I, we've had both done in the past. I haven't seen much in the last two years, but when I first started, we had. People come in and bring me a receipt and say, hey, I use my, I use my own money, but I want to be reimbursed for discretionary for creating some handouts for a town hall meeting. I, we had that in the past. Okay. Oh, um, okay. Go ahead. We'll keep that question there. I, um, I Council Member Cuesta? Uh, you bet. I'm going to jump over to F um, in the draft and in the prior... Um, or in the current policy, it looks mm. like it mm -hmm. is six regarding tablets, computers. Uh, so, discretionary funds may be used to purchase a tablet, computer, printer, and technical equipment for city business. The computer equipment provided to each city council member uh, shall come out of city, uh, shall be a standard expense to the city. So, the taxpayers were very generous, everybody got an iPad. Does this say that in addition to the iPad I've been provided, I can go buy a tablet? It seems to read that way. That's and then my question would be, is that my property then? It doesn't imply that I need to ever give it back. So I could go buy, I love Chromebooks. These are about a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. I go buy a new Chromebook every year and just have four mm -hmm. by the time I'm done with my tenure. They all got turned back in. Well, not really. Um, <laughs> so you're exactly right. The way in which this policy is written, and again, this has been in place. This is not new. This has been in place for a while. So heretofore, we had a member who said, you know what, I don't want a whatever pad, Lenovo pad. I want a, an iPad okay. or I want a Mac Pro. Mac Pro. And so we allowed that member uh, who's no longer with us to actually use his discretion, some of his discretionary funds to pay partially because a MacBook Pro is very expensive, right. 1600 bucks. part of that. And I think, you know, from talking through IT, some of these some of these IT assets are are obsolete within three years, and so you're absolutely right. You could buy a Chromebook, which probably has a shorter lifespan than a MacBook does, um, and we haven't asked for them to be turned in. In some cases, they have been for other reasons, whether it was the city issued one had problems or you got Cheetos into the keyboard or something like that. Um, you know, we've had to clean that. So. <coughs> That's been an issue. <laughs> the city issued one, and the person said did not want it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason I have that question, certainly not because I want to do that, it does seem that the city has provided an iPad. Yeah. That's what you guys. Yeah. Um, or you have uh, the folks in IT get you a Chromebook instead, or whatever the case may be, as opposed to be able to just, you know, buying a new computer every year, which this seems to provide that allowance. Mm -hmm. The printer ink even makes sense to me. I can yeah. see people are printing their own materials, but yep. uh, it's where you get into the, really the hardware of a tablet or a computer that, it seems excessive if the city's already providing you with um, it. Yeah. And actually, we didn't touch this, but again, oh. th these are discussions that we had as staff. We said that maybe should be amended since we're already providing a mm -hmm. device yeah. where that's amended out, but you could still go buy a printer or ink cartridges. Okay. And just to clarify, we did actually change this. Um, currently, it reads additional discretionary funds, which implies exactly what Councilmember Quest was saying. Yeah. 
This is money is above the $600. The city hasn't figured out where it's going to come from in the budget, but additional discretionary monies. So the major change that we made to that one was we took out the word additional and we just said your discretionary funds, which limits you to your $600. So it's, it actually is a large limitation on what you are currently allowed. Okay, so one thing that I would like to do is when someone brings this up, um, is stick to that one issue and see if we've got consensus. If we're going to delete it, let's just delete it. And um, so, you need to go back to L and N. Yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's do the Let's do F first, yeah. since we're here right now. And then, yes, I agree. Yeah, I'll talk about F then. Okay. So. Yeah, I, I always understood this to mean what I think you're trying to, ch well, I'm not sure now, maybe. <laughs> so um, when we first started using these, we were all awarded them. Mm -hmm. And those that didn't want to use them, I don't know if they got them or not. I think they did, and they never used them, and they never brought them. I don't know what they did with them, but we all did. And the, the word was that, and it was the first time, so we've been just doing this over the last probably six years maybe, mm -hmm. and I was told that I'm in charge of it if it breaks. It's mine now. It's totally mine. i got to figure it out, take good care of it, and if something goes wrong with it, if the IT can't really, like they might might do some things to help me, but yep. if it's a goner, you know, it's up to me and I buy it, and it would come from probably my discretionary, I would, it would allow for it to come from discretionary funds, but, but and if I wanted a second one, I could use my discretionary funds like that. Nobody's going to monitor that as long as it fits within things that could be bought. That's what I was told back then. And I've never needed to do anything since then, but I thought that's what everybody was doing. Now that we can change that, but mm -hmm. I mean, I think people had things break down and switch from a laptop to an iPad or back and forth because things weren't working right for them. I. I mean, I think if we're going to go back to that L and N thing about discretionary funds, it needs to include <coughs> this, whether or not people can. The what, what's the breadth of the discretionary fund? Mm. Right. And as a point of information, are the iPads our property now? If I resign tomorrow, I get to keep the iPad? Um, we really don't have a policy on that. It seems to me that should belong to the taxpayer. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Should go I agree. I think, for the, I think for those members who've been there for your four-year term, by the time you reach the four, end of the four-year term, we said it's obsolete. We don't want it back. I, I have one. You can have it. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll recycle it. No. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> okay, so uh, Council Member Barentine, are you want to take a different one or do you want to talk about F or L and N? I thought we were finishing it. Uh, if we're if we're going to go through this um, and try to make you know cut this discussion down a little, then I would prefer that we take it from the beginning and go through each one and then make a decision of whether we want to keep it in there or not so that we're not missing anything. The second thing is, is that on the altar of uh, constant uh, financial responsibility, I do not want to limit any council person from being able to do their job. If they believe that they need a special keyboard in order to function, then so be it. I think that that needs to be some of the cost of business. Um, the discretionary funds, I think, are are separate from the cost of doing business and I think that there's some pieces especially for F where we're shoving the cost of doing business and we are employees and we need to make sure that we can do our job the best that we can and ensure that future councils can too on behalf of the taxpayer I am not going to step over a dollar to pick up a penny on somebody being able to do their job so if um, there is some <coughs> guidelines as to equipment or, or whatever people think they need. I mean, back in the day when Lori Clapp and Julie Grizoulis were here, they they did keep their computers way back in the day. <laughs> they, they did. We were all kind of surprised, but it all got explained to us at the, as surprised as we were that um, they weren't worth anything by the time they got done with their four years either, and yeah. I'm sure they're worth a lot less now. So I want to be very cautious about... Um, hamstringing what very small amount of funding is available for council people while I may not have used any of this if it something should happen 
and I would need to use it, I think it's appropriate whether I have to use it or not, whether I'm wealthy enough or not, that I make sure that the people who come in the future are able to do their job. So I would like the policies to read longer term to go ahead and make sure that people have the equipment that they need, have the availability for information and, and um, that documents, you know, stuff coming to them outside of that discretionary fund piece. Now, I, I was always told that this money was for making sure that we could work with our constituents. So the mailing piece and doing some of that, being able to do your job, if something happens, and I know p people have gotten special mi m mouses. Is it mice? Mice. mice. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were two-handed mice, I don't know. <coughs> Um, but I'm not going to judge whether somebody it, it, it couldn't do their job with that or not. As far as whether it's somebody's equipment or not, I, I guess that's a policy we'll have to come up with. But if we could go through these, if the jumping around piece is being difficult, then I would prefer that we go through each one so okay. that we... All right, point taken. Council Member Olson. Uh, one other piece. When we first started this, where everyone got one. We also at that time, and it obviously never got written into anything, was that it would last your term, and it was yours, and so then you'd move on. And if somebody had one break in between, I mean, I really don't know what happened, because people did break things in between accidentally. Things happened, or they just, and so I don't know how you handled it. I didn't, I didn't worry about it. I figured it was figured out. And, um, but that, just to give you some background okay. on where we were, because I was the oh, council that actually started where everyone is going to get this. We, it, it was a financial decision to not have people going out to houses anymore and continue to, and most of us didn't want it that way anyway. We wanted it like this, so it cut down a person's time. It wasn't that anybody shouldn't do that. They could do whatever they wanted, but most of us wanted them like this. So Because they did it. They gave it to you at your house before. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. And I, I appreciate so, that, and I do greatly appreciate that. I, and I, I really <coughs> don't care how we how we go forward. I just think we got to get something written down because people have asked, you know, do you get to keep that? And we're like, yes. <laughs> Uh -huh. If you want the one I got before, you can. It doesn't do email, but you can borrow it if you'd like. <laughs> it does do Spotify for some reason. But, um, okay. Good. All right. Thank you, <laughs> Councilmember Cuesta. Thank you. Um, and, I, and maybe it just needs to get onto paper. However, we decide to do yeah. it. Um, I, I agree that we're employees of the city. I've never had left a job where they say, "Yeah, take the computer with you." That never happens. And you'll take your pencils back. Um, so I don't know why we take the computer. <laughs> oh, you, you work do. mean places. Um, yeah. I work for the state. I work for the. <laughs> <laughs> No wonder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then the other thing, well, you know, the metaphor of us, uh, let's see, we're jumping over dollars to pick up pennies. I'd like to see the point where we get all of them. Let's pick up the pennies, let's pick up the dollars. Uh, if, if there's places we can um, trim the sales a little bit, make some money here and there on the big items and the little items, we should. My job. Okay. I, um, so I do, I think we probably should go back through these in order. I mean, starting with A. And, um, and actually, if we read them in order, it could help us. Like discretionary funds in the sum of $600 shall be allocated for each council person per annum. Those funds not to be used in any calendar year shall revert to the general fund. Councils as a body shall make a conscientious effort to remain within the designated budget each year. So if we have $600 to spend, all of these things in here, I mean, we're limited to the $600. We can't buy every one of these things. Um, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. Is there anybody that wants to talk about that? No, but I have a point of uh, maybe process here, okay. I guess, information. Are we, um, can we just go through each one and say thumbs up, thumbs down, or yeah. I want to talk about I, it, and just get through this really fast? Yeah, I don't even need you to read it out loud. Yeah. I can read it very quickly. Okay. Okay. That's I, I would just like to push our way through. Yeah, this and I, point, I agree with that. Point of order for the public, I would like it read. Because okay. the public doesn't have this in front of them. Okay, it doesn't take just that long. Just read it quickly, and let's do up and down. Okay. All right, uh, B. It is the intention of city council. Is that a yes on A? <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Okay, so. actually just say yes out loud. All right, okay. great. You got six thumbs up. Is it the intention of the city council... It is the intention of the City Council that discretionary funds be used in the metropolitan area surrounding the City of Inglewood. Discretionary funds shall not be used for out-of-state expenses unless approved by City Council. An application for use of discretionary funds for an out-of-state trip 
may be applied for after the fact, but if the city council disapproves of the expenditure, the council member must pay back any of the discretionary funds used during the trip. Yes? yes. I have a question about okay. this. Okay. Did this happen? Not when, to my knowledge. When Mayor Jefferson went to China on this scale, did he? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, okay. I just, really? I can't even figure out why this is in there. Yes, I agree. It's been in there for, for a long time. Yeah, it's probably. Okay. It's, yes, it bumps yes. up. Okay. Okay. Um, C, discretionary funds may be used for the purchase of books, publications, newspapers, or materials directly related to the responsibilities of the city council. Materials purchased with discretionary funds are not personal property and shall be made available to other council members on request. Materials, tapes, publications, etc., obtained at a conference or purchased with discretionary funds shall be made available to all of the council members and city staff on request. Yes? Question? Okay. I buy, um, I don't know, what was the book that, that you had on? Oh, uh, Better Not Bigger or something? Yeah, yeah. If you buy that, then all of us are now, it's all of ours. Is that the, what that's saying? If she buys it with if city it, money. She buys it with a P card. Yeah, if, I, yeah, if we buy it with city money. Mm -hmm. Okay. On request. Mm -hmm. On request, but most of us don't even know what people buy, so. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, I'm fine. So that's yes. All right. D, individual memberships to an organization service clubs, etc., may be paid from discretionary funds provided the city council member states the city-related purpose for the membership. Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, e. We already decided, oh, uh, wait. Discre I'm going to read E anyway. Discretionary funds may be used for meals that are directly related to the responsibilities of the city council. Expenditures for alcoholic beverages shall only be as a part of a meal as opposed to separate expenditure where it is necessary as a part of the establishment's policy to have separate tickets for food and beverage purchases. Compliance shall be satisfied so long as noted on the receipts by the council person. So the part of I want to talk about that. Okay. I think that you have to have the discretionary fund maybe used for meals that are re directly related to the responsibilities. It's the expenditures of the alcohol that you want to take out. Okay. Is everybody? Yeah, it works for me. Okay. That's fine. All right. Um, F, discretionary funds may be used to purchase a tablet, computer, laptop, uh, computer, printer, ink, or other technical equipment to be used for city business. The computer equipment provided to each council member for use at city council meetings and regular member business shall be a standard expense of the city and not associated with city discretionary funds. I guess I'll jump in here. Uh, I would be a no on this one. And discretionary funds may be used to purchase uh, tablet, computer, laptop, computer. I would either eliminate that because you're already being provided one or that you can still make that purchase, uh, but uh, said hardware must be returned to the city at end of um, term. Okay, uh, Council Member Olson. Another option would be to, for, the, um, for the cost, the current cost of the equipment to be assessed. Uh, and then the person could buy it back from the, buy it to the city. That's, I'd like to make that available so you don't end up with a bunch of junk. Um, I agree I, with that. I, I mean, it's true. I, I okay. work in a setting where I've got lots of junk. Okay. <laughs> if you want to take it home, please. 100 bucks, it's yours. Please take it home. Okay. That kind of stuff might be useful. I, and if not, and you need it, great. Okay. At one point, they did ask him if, the, like, for a very nominal fee, they could take some of the computer stuff. So okay. it's been handled different. So is her wording amenable to everyone? Um, yes. Um, could you word it again? Okay. Just a point. I don't want, you don't want junk? Yeah. A point of clarification. Our charter says that anything that's owned by the city can only be disposed of through auction. So that may be in conflict with policy, but I'll let the legal... <coughs> I'm a law school dropout, so I'll let that. <laughs> <laughs> the other option is if, you serve, if it's four years old or older, it's yours. If it's as if it has a value, yeah. then it mm -hmm. comes back to city council. So there's actually a little bit of wiggle room there. But what you said is you'd like for us to look and see if there's a way for you just to purchase that instead of it just remaining trash at the city. Yeah. We'll look at it so we can bring back. Yeah, and then the other the other piece with this is I. Uh, 
I don't know how things were done in the past, um, Manager Keck, in terms of when things did break, and I think people were using discretionary <coughs> fund. And I, I know I mm -hmm. think I used discretionary fund to buy this keyboard that you, you did. all gave me this, and then I used discretionary fund to, to buy a keyboard. Correct. So I thought that's what I was supposed to do. I didn't know that maybe you all could get them that way. So I, I think that needs to be clear about, and I can see people needing I've never done this, but I can see wanting to get printer ink and other things, and that you'd use your 60, 50, yeah. 60 dollars for that and not have to, you know, because you're doing monthly meetings and yeah. doing it all. I frankly don't charge this stuff because I hate keeping track of it. So right. it's mm -hmm. not because I'm wealthy. <coughs> <it's been laughs> suggested someone on our call. I just don't want to keep track of all this for that small amount at this point. I've done it for some things, but not for. You know, and plus, how do I figure out which how much ink? I have one printer, <laughs> my husband uses it for work. So then how do I do that? It's just too complicated, so. Okay, all right, <laughs> thank you. In um, order for that to work, I think that we would need to have a little bit more understanding on what the um, computer equipment provided to each council for the council meetings, because there have been additional um, equipment provided to people, and, and if that's just at the, you know, how well you're getting along with the city manager at the moment, I mean, or the previous city manager. Um, uh, the, I want to make sure that we have a little bit more understanding what that includes because I don't think that's, that has not come out of everybody's discretionary fund. So we want to make sure that there's some um, understanding okay. of what you can get. So if you do need some accommodations for certain things or it's easier for you to use something different, you know that you can get this, but you would have to use your discretionary funds for something else. So if we, we, if we could just outline it a little bit better on what's involved in that, that would help. Okay, and that's what and hopefully it would avoid the on correct. laptop thing. Okay. All right. Um, Council Member Wink, did you have something? Uh, no. Thank you. Okay. Uh, G, all receipts must be turned in within 15 days of date of expenditure to facilitate reconciliation with finance department. Failure to comply may result in non-payment for that expense. Some yes. The, okay. Some of the trips are, are like the Washington trip. Is that reasonable? I mean, I've I, never gone. I've never but seen anything 15 days. 30 days seems like. But I, but I usually we use P cards, so it's never been a problem. Or we've had a pre. Uh, it's important that you return given the us receipts. Given us the money ahead of time. Yeah. So, um, but is that enough time? Like, if they go to Washington or something like that, that is that a reasonable time frame? That's all I'm asking. Oh, in, I, I think it is. I think in today's day and age, I think most of this stuff is an electronic more, receipt yeah. for your hotels and things like this. Yeah. I think so. We just want to make sure you give us a receipt because we've had to try to, per, you know, put P cards through, and our policy is that all receipts must be present. I think that's what that's for too. So. Is it 15 days business or 15? <laughs> 15 days. She said 10. She said 10 before. Exactly. <laughs> um, Listen. And actually, being forced to re to uh, review this. The state of Colorado has actually changed that. Um, historically, if something's written in the law and it's 10 days or less, it's business days. If it's greater than 10 days, it's regular days. But the state of Colorado, just to make my life a little harder, <laughs> about three years ago said they're tired about distinction. Basically, if it says days, it is calendar days, the end. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you've got 15 days, it would be calendar days. Okay. I've never, I've never activated a P card, and I don't go on trips that much, so I, I don't care. I just was asked when 15 okay. days seemed a little tight. Days we okay. will, yeah. we will move yeah. on. H, um, discretionary funds shall be used in a manner that would, vi may, shall not be used, <laughs> <laughs> shall not be used in a manner that would violate the Fair Campaign Practices Act or any other law. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, discretionary funds shall not be used for individual charitable contributions as such contributions are made by the city council as a body through the council aid to other agencies account. That is council so, that has been violated so many times over the 20 years, <laughs> whether I've been on council or not. The band comes, well, we'll give, we got our discretionary fund, we'll go ahead and yeah, give it to that. that. They're taking this trip, we'll go ahead and use our discretionary fund for that. So it's, I mean, I'm a little confused that that's, I, I assume that was in there before, and they still did it anyway. So, so are you amenable to it being in here, just following it? Uh, yes or no? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Sure, go ahead, Councilmember Barentine. 
Chair, Council I member. Yes or no. I was repeating what Mayor uh -huh. Bertram said. Council member Berentine, please go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm a little confused about that. <clears throat> I would like to leave it in there. Um, I, I would not like to leave it in there. I think that it's, I think that it's wholly appropriate if council people who have not spent their stuff, somebody comes forward to council and they want to go ahead and use that discretionary fund at that time, I think they should be able to, like they have done in the past. Okay, so, so how it's reading um, is that we can't use it. Right. Mm -hmm. This wouldn't allow what we've been doing. So like when FBLA students come and they get one, the final, and they get to go somewhere nationally, some of us have given mm -hmm. our the so. cancer thing that happened, the, the walks, the, the different, the, I think the Bintner race at one time, the, the different things, and council goes, you know what, we Thank would like, God. I have a few, I would like to go ahead and put my month's worth of this time in. And so I would prefer that that stay available. So, I think it's been a nice thing that council okay. has done. So is there other feedback on that? Yes. Okay. Uh, council member Cuesta. Uh, we're describing these funds to do our job. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't require that as within the purview of doing our job. Those are great acts, should be done out of the kindness of people's heart, and should be funded, I think, with the council members, um, their own funds. Uh, secondarily, who is who has oversight of these? When somebody turns in a receipt and there's something questionable, who raises that issue? <laughs> We're not seeing them. No, that puts me in a and or finance in a very difficult position. And I'm glad you mentioned that because there have been instances in the past where it really does put us in a tough spot. I, I'm not, I am, obviously I work for you, um, but you're putting me in a position if you turn in a, an alcohol receipt or, you know, you accidentally use your P card and buy gas. This has happened before. Or I use my, somebody's used their P card to buy something and, and I see this receipt, I'm like, what is this? And I ask the person for, the member for that information, they're like, J you know, here's yeah. my receipt. I'm in a tough spot. So perhaps there could be some sort of process worked in here for that too, because it puts our staff in a really tough spot, because they're like, well, we just got to pay this, because that's a council person, or that's the mayor. Well, that's not good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no. Absolutely not. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, something, okay. it, things should be flagged. And not everything, of course, but if you mm -hmm. find things that are obviously questionable. Um, and not to embarrass anybody. Either. No, no, not at all. No. The examples I brought up, by the way, were done on council. I mean, I, okay. they were very public. That's how I knew about them. Um, council Member Olson. Yeah, I, I, um, I do like that we, we are able to do some of the ones. We, I, I don't regret any of them at all. And oh. we've done a few, only a few, less than five probably in my time. Um, and they were legitimate things that we would have done, probably aid to other agencies, had we known. I mean, the students that won the FBLA, they, we wanted to support them as representing our city. It made great sense. So I wonder if we could include in here a, uh, a vote, uh, an approval by the council to do it that way. And that would allow us to do something. And nobody <coughs> does it. I don't get to give my $50 to some FBLA out of the blue on my own. It has to be a council approved thing. So maybe, maybe we leave it here, shall not be used, except by special vote or some special consideration and vote by council. The other thing would be relating to what you're talking about, Manager Keck, is things that come forward to you. Um, I mean, I think that's the nature of the job that you're gonna have to continue to do. I don't think all of us wanna see everybody's receipts, but I do think that uh, regular reporting of what we all do and how we spend our money might be helpful hmm. because then you can have a notation in there of what it's for. And I mean, in my work, I have to note everything that I spend, and it's in a sheet, and anybody can look at it at any time and say, who was there, what was it for, you know, where, you know, that kind of stuff. That's, that's kind of common practice, and we could just make that available every quarter or something. Just well, it's available a, every day, isn't it? It is on the open gov. But it's yep. not you have to know what you're looking by for. Council, by council, I've never looked at it. No, it's, it's not it's, by council. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it's by name. Is it? Okay. We had oh, point point of, okay. Okay. So anyway, I'm just trying to make it a little bit easier for you, or you don't have to. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Okay, it's already on the site, but maybe once a quarter, or maybe sure. every half year, there's a newsletter edition piece of information under, you know, that extra thing. And just yeah. That, there's transparent for everybody. It's been in one place, and I don't know. That's a good. That suggestion. might help okay. you feeling like you know. And then we can question if we want halfway sure. through the year. 
Okay. All right. I don't know. I'm just suggesting. Thank you. Council Member Martinez. Uh, thank you. I would prefer to leave it as is, or I actually like Council Member Olson's suggestion of um, if a member uh, makes a suggestion to help SBLA, for example, it would require a vote of Council. Okay, and um, all right, Council Member Wink. Thank you. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding the second uh, part of the statement accurately because it seems to me that it's indicating something similar to what Council Member Olson's proposing. That so discretionary funds shall not be used for individual charitable contributions, meaning mine versus Council Member Kless's, correct? Mm -hmm. As such contributions are made by the City Council as a body through Council Aid to other agencies' account. And the examples that I've heard from several Council Members who've been yeah. here before, it seems that they're, you've, you've all been very supportive of the, the charities, the charitable gifts you've given and that so it seems like the statement is supporting what you all like anyway I mean maybe we do need a final vote but I, I think it reads pretty well it's, right I, no well, I just saw how you could read it like that I, oh really am yeah, I completely wrong it's like that two-faced face you know where one's a woman one's <laughs> yes a the Janet um, yeah I could see I could read it both ways <coughs> an individual yeah I think it needs to be cleaned up if that's what mm -hmm. it's a little okay. and so, I also have a question that, um, and we can do with what we want to with this, but if council wants to have money for people that come, perhaps we should set aside some of the aid to other agency monies instead of giving yes. it all away at the beginning. Um, you have $2,500 you have $2, this year, yeah. for example. And okay. It seems like this. Yeah, I, I agree. It seems and, like this and council. That's why I think we haven't done it. Very recently. amenable. Uh, okay, so I mean, if if we were to do that, then um, we'd still need to clean up the wording in here about shall not um, be used for individual, because there's a double type meaning. Right. Any suggestions, Councilmember Barron? My concern is that the way that it reads. Reading it a little differently is that that uh, charitable contributions are made through the aid to other agencies only in that process, and that is a um, an application process that has got very de defined um, procedures and um, how we participate and that we vote on it. I have not ever seen um, really. To all the council's credits, when somebody comes and goes, well, I have $50 left in mine, I would like to go ahead. And I, I think several of you guys have already done that. And, and then the rest of council goes, is that okay? And then they actually have kind of voted, I mean, or voted and said, is that all right? Can we do that? And, and so I think it's been very open in doing that piece of it when somebody feels that there's kind of some kind of you know, disproportion in that. What I'm concerned about is that this seems to read that it can only be done through aid to other agencies, which I'm actually kind of uh, I'm not, I don't like that process and I'm kind of against that process. So I, I don't want to take away that piece when somebody's willing to go ahead and dip into the funding that they have available when they think something's important in the city um, that's kind of come up like that. but. Uh, it seems <coughs> to push it back into the purview of back into the aid to other agencies, and that's how I read it. Okay, thank you. Council Member Wink, did you have another? I do, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So, um, so, so this council aid to other agencies account, that's the name of this account, and it has a stringent application process? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if everyone's in agreement with what Member Barentine said, maybe we can word this um, to state discretionary funds may be used for individual charitable contribution may be used for individual charitable contributions um, 
as well as through the, I mean, uh, maybe it needs to even just go away. I don't know. So, I th Were you for I've never the seen case? this application process for this uh -huh. account, um, but. Uh, okay, so. I'm for keeping the vote, I think that. You're for keeping the. Um, the vote piece with it, but separating it out so that it's not tied to the aid to other agencies. Okay, so do you under, do you have direction oh. that you need? This is what I'm hearing. Discretionary funds shall not be used for individual charitable contributions as such contributions are made by the city council as a body. This provision may be waived with approval of council. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yes. Uh, I disagree with that, but if it's going to go before council, <laughs> sure. Yeah, okay. you'll have it. Yeah. Okay. Um, J, usage of a city-issued credit card is permissible for discretionary expenditures subject to separate credit card usage agreement. Okay. Yes. That's a yes? Yes. K, an expenditure form shall be used for documentation of all expenses. Is that still accurate or is that? We don't have an expenditure form. Yeah. But what we do require is that when somebody has made an expenditure, either with a P card or with their personal funds, that they provide us with the requisite documentation to show what, what they're trying to be reimbursed for, what they've expended on the P card. Can you reflect that instead of? Yes, yes. I, we don't yes I can. OK. So is that a yes? Could form, could form maybe process? process? It form could. And process. Maybe. Okay. We're trying to go paperless, actually. So would you share? Would you mind sharing You're again? So essentially, just a receipt. Somebody's turning in. Yes, yeah, sir. That's already addressed, though, right? Yeah, 15 days. Yeah. yeah. Well, some accountant got mad because <laughs> I wanted the reform done. What we have is it, Kevin Ingalls, who's an accountant who does the accounting for this. He keeps tabs on who spent funds, for example, out of the general operating supplies line for the city council, and he keeps track of how much Martinez has spent and Olson and Cuesta and so forth. But we don't require you to keep a form. We just need you to give us a documentation. Okay, so can I ask you a question also? When you're going through and editing these, if there is some that we have missed in the process or there are duplicates, will you bring that to our attention the next time that? I'd be happy to. Okay, thank you. Council Member Cuesta. Uh, so I do, uh, I have a big expensive dinner and I just hand you a receipt. And so it's, it's later, six months from now, somebody goes, well, what's Cuesta doing? Spend 150 bucks on dinner. Who do you have dinner with? What's he doing? And you're just going to be like, well, I gave him the receipt. Yeah. I, I really oh, they'll be asking you. Be a notation of some sort. Yeah. I, I, Who's there great. and what was the purpose? That's yeah. for you to decide. For anything that doesn't help. I agree. I mean, I've. Cleaner. Yeah. I think it, so, every, too. Every time I've used a P card in the last 20 years. It's, it just, yeah, it, I mean, it I puts you in a more for, comfortable I position. Myself, yeah. yeah, because you need that data to But that's also what the P-card policy account. says, too, before that. It says that agreement one, number K, or no, J. Yes. You have that ex expenditure. That's indicated in the in P-card policy in that use agreement that we have each person sign when they take a card. So if I take somebody to lunch, I can't just say, you know, I took somebody to lunch. I have to show who, who did I take to lunch. Okay. And do you have to say what the purpose was? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I write on the back of the receipt. So I'll say, uh, for example, I'm in this local government group, so I took Wendy Rubin and, you know, Mark Relf and somebody to lunch at, at Steakhouse 10, and it was a local government group meeting. There it is. Council Member Berntang. The only, the only difference would be, and uh, if you think you're going to be buying a lot of $150 dinners and get reelected, that's up to you. Good luck. Uh, but there is a certain there is a certain trust piece in here too, because the there <coughs> part of the reason that um, your constituents have a certain amount of uh, anonymity that they are entitled to. They are not necessarily. Um, uh, have to be wet, laid out there that you sit there and make it public every person that you're speaking to. So you have to be somewhat cautious of um, doing that too, because if you put if you 
are buying somebody coffee and you're of a mind to go ahead and get reimbursed for it, you need to be very cautious that you're not sitting there saying every name of somebody that you're speaking to either. Some people want to be able to, they have the right to address their elected officials and some, and they have some opportunity for anonymity. <coughs> they don't have, every conversation you have is not purview for public either. So I don't know how we handle that. Okay. So I'm trying to look at the city attorney, but she keeps it back. <coughs> oh. You were asking me a question? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was, I was looking at something else. <laughs> I think, I think. Okay. Uh, All right. Council member question. I think the difference is if I just speak with Scott Gilbert, who I was driving his bike down the block and say, hi, it, it, of course it's not disclosable. If you're going out to eat with somebody and that person is eating on the city's dime, then yeah, I think you do need to disclose that. I agree. That to me is the difference is whether or not city's taxpayer money is spent along the way on that person. I agree. Okay. That's why I don't spend city money, so I don't have to. Do okay, that. but I, I, I agree. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so. Um, <laughs> Council Member Olson. I, I do think we should be upfront about this. I think it's. I think the citizens deserve it. If we're talking about, you know, <laughs> passing by the pennies for something, this is part of sure. exposing the penny and saying what it went for. Um, and I think that when people meet with us, they need to know there are some parts of it that is a part of this open and transparent piece. Right. And that's part of it. I mean, I feel like I should wear my name tag into some things that are not necessarily yeah. in Englewood just because I feel like I should probably disclose I'm an elected official, but you go with these two different hats to some things, wondering when should I, when should I not. Uh, I, I think people need to know, and if you think that they're not going to want to be on your coffee every week, say, you know, i got to stop buying your coffee because your name's going to keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the other piece of this, though. This, uh, this protects us. It, I see more as a mm -hmm. protection sure. to you and, you know, that you did the $150 dinner and it was legitimate. <laughs> you know, I know. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you went out to coffee and you spent five bucks and it, it protects you in Agreed. saying this is who it was. I don't know. Agreed. All right. Well, I, I would, I, I, I agree then. I, th I think that's a good idea then. If s any city money is spent, then it should be identified who, who all has been, who, who's participated in whatever money's been spent. So if the money's spent, then okay. Okay. Um, would you clarify that? Because we there were so many points of view, and I was typing so fast, I've missed part of what Councilmember Barentine was talking about. I'm left with a consensus of wants to require documentation of what the expenditure involved. We're changing um, K to some language that clarifies that this body wants to require documentation of what the expenditure involved. Is that correct? That I, I would say all expenses uh, uh, turned in for either use of discretionary funds or via the P card, either way, either re reimbursed directly or <coughs> P card, will be documented with one, a receipt, two, with notation as to who was, who was involved. involved and for what purpose. It's fine to say I, I met with a constituent to talk about ADUs, you know? I don't know. Right. Okay. Um, Council District 2 or District 2 issues. I think. Right. And we just have to make sure that whatever we put in here has to be the same as what the P card requires. Also, I'm, oh, yeah. we shouldn't, right. Right. we don't want it so conflicting. Far, so. but it, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Let's move on to L. A member may, at such member's cost, use whatever means are available to the public in the marketplace to communicate with constituents, which includes, but is not limited to, mail, email, faxes, newspaper, inserts, posters, flyers, banners, signs, telephone conference calls, video conferencing, automated telephone calls, audio and video messaging, advertisements, public service announcements, and handouts, and coffee with a constituent. Generally, the cost of constituency communications are paid for by the member. The member may request use of telephone, fax machine, or other device on an occasional basis to communicate directly with, with a constituent or to copy a document to be distributed to constituents. The city manager shall direct that the cost of using such devices be charged against the member's discretionary fund balance. 
Yes or no? That works for me. <laughs> I actually put. Uh, the, the whole thing just needs to go. F <laughs> just, go away? Yes. I put no. First of all, I, I don't want in any of our policies or procedures anything that says what I can do at my cost. It's, sure. it's, uh, it's useless in there. And I don't even want the impression that there's some kind of restriction that the city can place on me on what I do with my own money. That's insane. Um, generally, the cost of constituency communications are paid for by the member is um, what this whole section is supposed to define. So that also isn't <coughs> necessary. And the member may request, I mean, it just is, okay. I just don't see anything redeeming in the entire thing and it's not necessary and it's somewhat redundant. Okay, so you want it to go away, Council Member Wink? Thank you. Earlier when I spoke, I did miss that point. I, I think I just assumed it was referring to discretionary funds. So it does seem odd to me that we are dis going through line item after line item regarding discus discretionary funds. And this one, it sticks out then like a sore thumb because it okay. has nothing to do with how we can spend that $600. Right. So okay. what's the point? Right. Sorry, I missed that earlier. Oh, that's okay. Uh, maybe it's a good so, thing we're going through yeah. one thing at a time. Yeah. Council Member Olson. Is part of this to help with members coming in and asking, can I borrow, or, you know, I'm here, I want to borrow the phone, or back when people didn't have a fax machine and needed to use one, and maybe it was just saying it's okay to do that, but don't do that all the time? Hmm. I mean, maybe that's not happening. Is there any reason why we should do something that limits our coming in bugging the daylights out? <laughs> Nobody really asked for this. <clears throat> However, this puts me in another awkward position. Because last year, when a member uh, utilized the discretionary funds inappropriately, I was painted with the brush that I approved it and read it and wrote it and did none of it, other than just said, the member said, do this, and we've done it in the past and just did it. So, yeah, this is, as far as I'm concerned, that's, it's up to the council to decide what you want to do with the disposition of this. But we don't get asked to use our equipment very often. Are there, are there any equipment that you would see that we need to... Or I mean, we have, we don't have like former Mayor Jefferson would sit in the conference room and use a telephone, and I'm like, fine, that's great, you know, no, no big deal. That's, we have a room up there. there. We do, yeah. <coughs> that's what I'm talking about. That's our room. That's what you I'm talking about. use the phone in our room. <laughs> that's okay. right. I'm fine with mixing it. Okay. Mixing it also. Um, Councilmember Wink, did you? Yeah, just a small comment to what Member Olson um, asked. So if... If Member Olson, you feel that um, if perhaps this this language was added for that purpose, then let's get perhaps we could get rid of L and and just make sure somewhere else in an appropriate place, not under discretionary funds, it's stated clearly that you know don't abuse the city manager about you know using X, Y, and Z, Nobody something like that. Idea. Well, I think it should be stated that nobody <laughs> does is mm -hmm. fortuitous, but yeah, it is. doesn't Thank you. protect you. <laughs> well, and so I think no, it'll, I that. it will help you out also if we yeah. nix it, right? Yeah. Because then you're not done. Yeah. Sorry, no fax machine. So, and we can, <laughs> we'll have to keep notes. I mean, I think that there may be things that we come across in the next year or so that we would want to add something in later. But, okay, so we're nixing that M. No discretionary funds shall be used in association with constituency communications in the 90 days prior to any election date upon which individuals are running for a seat upon the city council. Yes, are we okay with that? Yep. Okay. Um, and city council or council members may use their discretionary funds to pay the postage associated with a mass mailing. A mass mailing is an unsolicited mailing initiated by a member to his or her constituency totaling 25 or more pieces of substantially identical content whether such mail pieces are deposited to the USPS as a single as single pieces or in bulk or at the same time single drop or different times cumulative over the course of a single budget year the term mass mailing and mass communication do not apply to mailings communications in direct response to mail communications from persons to whom the matter is transmitted. transmitted. That is a solicited response. Um, just so that you know, this is 
the language that comes from Congress. That's where I went and found this particular language because I was asked questions several months ago about what is, when is it a mass mailer or how do we do it? And there really was nothing even at the state level, but these issues are popping up in cities all over the state. And so I went looking and I thought the language from Congress was, obviously I changed Congress to you know, to match city council, but that's where this language came from. So this is this particular provision in, this is brand new to the policy manual. Okay, so I'm gonna read one and two underneath this because they go along. Mm -hmm. um, one, a copy of the document to be mass mailed must be submitted to the city manager for inclusion in the council packet for informational purposes at least two weeks prior to the date of intended mailing. At such council meeting prior to the mailing, the council may by majority vote direct the city manager to deny use of discretionary funds to pay the costs of the proposed mailing if such mailing is in violation of the law. I don't know why we have to have that in there. I mean, <laughs> if it's in violation of the law, we wouldn't do it, would right. we? Um, but any council member commenting on such mailing at a public meeting <coughs> will do so in strict compliance with the rules of decorum provided in section eight of this policy manual. And is section eight of this policy manual, does it apply to that? It's just your rules of decorum. That's your decorum. Yeah. Ethical rules, gifts, and gratuities. And ethical rules, gifts, and gratuities, that's decorum? That's supposed to be decorum, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Two, any mail distributed using discretionary funds will contain the following mass mail statement. This mailing was prepared, published, and mailed at taxpayer expense. The statement must appear on page one of a document or on the address side of the envelope or mailing panel label. Must be prominently displayed and not be printed in smaller than a seven point typeface. So, council member Cuesta. Uh, the portion that jumps out at me is that really the only way city council can override a fellow member's mailing is if it's a violation of the law. Let me just say something totally egregious, you know, off the rails, and you know, like, well, it's not against the law. They can do whatever they want and still send it out on the taxpayer's dime. Um, I uh, and I would live by the sword, die by the sword, and I don't intend to do any mass mailings. But I think it just should be that council can override any given mailing, at least per the use of discretionary funds. That city council member could still use their own funds if they so chose. Um, but I do think that um, if the majority of council feels it's an objectionable piece of um, mail, that it should be um, denied to use the discretionary funds to send it. Okay. Council Member Berntine? Yeah, I disagree with that. I mean, then um, you, have, you were elected by District 4, and if everybody here thinks that we ought to have PUDs and density, and you go, nope, I don't. And we go, well, we're not going to allow you to use any of your funds to con to talk to your <coughs> constituency because we disagree with what you're sending out. That's inappropriate. That's an inappropriate control of council over one council member using these dollars that are meant to be able to go ahead and communicate with your constituents. I've not ever sent out a mass mailing, so I, I probably won't ever but I, I don't think that we put ourselves in a good position when we can have majority rule over <coughs> ideas and thought and communication and I think that's inappropriate okay thank you did you want to respond just, just once again the difference being uh, if it's that editorial hmm. that these are your opinions that should council be paying for that or should the taxpayers be paying for that if these are just informative there's a meeting on AB news on this date we'd like to hear your opinion that's one thing but if one council member is just going to, uh, as you described it, state their opinion and here's what we should be doing, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think that that should be paid for by um, the taxpayer. I think these should be informational, not editorial. And I would okay. I would like to. Um, <coughs> I I agree with that, and you're you're coming from a basis of logic and kindness and non-political, and quite honestly, I have seen. It happened where just because your opinions are not or the issue is not controversial, but just the fact that you might be um, 
communicating with your constituents, and that might put you in a better stead with your constituents or might make you more popular among your constituents, or I just don't want you to be able to do that. And if the majority of this council doesn't much care for you, then we could find some objection to what you're doing. And I don't think that that's a power you should put in the hands of other elected officials with something that you're just trying to do for your, um, for your representation. You have to have some flexibility, even when the majority of council disagrees with you, to be able to go ahead and communicate with your constituents. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Brantine. Uh, Councilmember Wink. Thank you. I agree with Member Cuesta, and um, I think when, when, when we're looking at editorial and, and the, the potential for extreme opinion pieces that, that aren't solely fact, factual, um, I, I think it is, it is a good idea for the council to, to make a, come to some agreement on whether or not we feel this represents the offices we hold or the positions we hold and and I don't believe that this council would ever make a decision against one of the rest of us because we don't like them um, I don't think that's what we're here for we we are elected into our positions for to do our job and use the skills and knowledge we have and for the betterment of our city and so I cannot imagine a circumstance under which one of us might make some decision against another one because we don't like them. So I don't think that would ever happen here. Um, but I, I, so I, I go with Mr. Cuesta on this one. I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I mean, okay. his initial example was perfect. I mean, somebody could just go on an absolute tirade often, I mean, just an egregious written piece and, and then it's then it's a statement on behalf of us paid for by taxpayer dollars that doesn't make any sense to me okay uh, council member Olson I, I get the concern and I have been bothered by some things that have been sent out sometimes that um, I've heard have been sent and misinformation that might be and I think that's what concerns me the most however I also <coughs> so I'm wondering about freedom of speech in this sure big time and then secondly uh, you could, in a roundabout way, say that um, our emails are under the same jurisdiction because while we don't pay for it out of our discretionary fund, we're hosted on a site that has lots of dollars that allows us to do this that actually has to be monitored for security so that nobody breaks down. I mean, there's, there's a lot of money behind us having an email even. So how do we create something where we're, we're helping each other do our best in communicating and not getting out misinformation or taking sides that are only going to make it hard to get the full citizen input. So I, while I want to say yes, I agree with you, I just think there's so many other ways it's still going on, and, and maybe it's because I use email more than anything else, and I know others do. Um, it's still being paid for by citizens. <laughs> right, right. Okay. That is obvious. Council Member Cuesta. And true, I see this a bit more compartmentalized. This is specific to discretionary funds, and emails are falling outside of that. At a minimum, if we did want to give um, any member carte blanche, as long as it's not illegal, you can write whatever you want with your discretionary funds. Yeah, I think it's still good if it goes before council, so these other council members have the option to go. Uh, I wildly just, any public um, mass mailings that go out still come before council so that people can weigh in and say, I disagree with this mailing. So they can at least go on the record and say, I do not support this. Uh, get that away from me. Um, okay. In a minimum. All right. And I appreciate that. Council I would member. love that opportunity, so I agree. I think it's a great, <laughs> an, a bit of an elegant solution. I'm not sure if it's going to be expedient for everybody, but I mean, I just think it would be helpful to have eyes on things that <coughs> we find out afterwards. But um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you, Council Member Barentine. Um, the last one that got sent out, I don't think was either egregious or um, illegal or controversial that much. Um, um, sometimes we may disagree with somebody if they're just aggrandizing themselves beyond what we think that they're entitled to, who knows. So I, I appreciate your comment about the, the freedom of speech and um, we wanna make policies certainly 
nobody at this table would ever do anything like that, and I, I agree, but it has been done before, and I imagine it could be done in the future, and so we have to make policies that are um, hopefully live beyond uh, this particular council and what happens. So I do agree, however, that we would have it come to council. I don't disagree that we should at least be able to go ahead and see what's uh, see what's going on. Hopefully, even if somebody is over-engrandizing or whatever or being controversial, we, we either know, if they're controversial, we already know that they hold some position probably already, but it would be nice to see the way that it's going out, and I will give some deference to the fact that it is taxpayer money, and we should at least have that uh, be public. I don't think that that's a problem. Um, uh, <clears throat> so I, I would agree with keeping the piece that it goes before council first. Okay, and, and that is in here, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. So kind of the way it's written, I think what council member Cuesta was asking for was kind of to amend it to say that anything council could go ahead even if it wasn't illegal. So I kind of, I agree with the way that it's written in there that it would come to council and sans it being illegal or violating the law that <coughs> council can't disapprove it unless it's illegal, but that it come to council. Okay, and is that correct understanding? And I go through back where you started, but yes. Okay. No, I appreciate the conversation, I really do. So do you have a question, Council? Yeah, is that, is that what it says, though? I'm not sure it says what you're expecting it to say, though. Uh, that it still not needs to go before Council two weeks before mailing, so then we can all review it, and I would think go on the record and say, I do not support the language. It's not illegal, so it's within that Council member's discretion to send it, but I personally do not agree with it. Okay. Is my okay. understanding how that's written? All right. Is that okay yeah. with everyone? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Discretionary funds shall not be used to send any card expressing holiday greetings from the member, although in an otherwise official mailing, a member may make an incidental holiday greeting. For example, in the salutation or signature in an official mailing, the member could say happy holidays or some other appropriate brief greeting. Holiday colors and illustrations are not considered incidental. No birthday, anniversary, wedding, birthday, or birth, retirement, or condolescence messages may be sent by an individual member using discretionary funds. So, can, can I ask a question? When we sent that birthday card, mm -hmm. um, was that sent with discretionary funds or no? No, it was not. It, actually, it was a uh, free card because Krista is very thrifty. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. The only <laughs> expense to you was the ink that you used to sign the card as well as the franking of the envelope to send it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Council Member Barentine. Um, I'm gonna go back to Council Member uh, Olson's freedom of speech. You can't tell me what to write on a card. <laughs> if I wanna say happy holidays, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever I wanna say on a card, I have freedom of speech to go ahead and do that. I think that when you start talking about the content of what, whatever somebody should write on that and whether the postage um, <coughs> is being sent. And, and why, why limit the kind of working with your constituency to sit there and go, no birthday, anniversary, wedding? It, that gets a little, I, I just think the thing is foolish. Are you going to read my card before I send it out and see what greeting I put on there? I say, who's going to... Don't look at me. I'm, I'm not reviewing who's anything. Even, who's even going to monitor this? I think this starts to get so... Um, first of all, we can't monitor it. And second, um, I, I think even if somebody was wishing to monitor it, I think it's ridiculous. Um, I think, it, I think it's ridiculous. So whether a stamp gets spent and it happens to be somebody's birthday, and I, and I think that that's a, an appropriate expenditure of it, then I don't want to limit anybody to that kind of thing. That's Okay, thank you. Council Member Wink. Thank you. Um, I'm okay with the language of O um, as, it, as it's stated here. And I think... Again, if it's if we're spending the discretionary fund, then we should behave within a certain some parameters. 
uh, if I want to maybe write something other than what what this suggests, then maybe I just buy the card with my own money and the stamp, and then I can write whatever I want. Okay. Right? I All mean, right. it doesn't mm -hmm. preclude us from doing that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Council Member Olson. Uh, this is a question for our city attorney. Have you seen this in other people's policies before to this extent? This is the language from Congress. Okay. I thought so. And certainly it's just been mistyped a little bit, right? Because there's some, like, no, I thought was a, I thought, what's, what's a no? No birthday anniversary. I think the common. No, oh, there's no comma in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so probably that when I copied and, uh, it, I looked at and it. And holiday colors and illustrations and are not considered incidental. So when I get, I, I got, <coughs> my language is bad. I'm grading papers right now, sorry. Um, so I, I wondered if this came from somewhere because I had heard that Congress does it like this too because I have a workplace that also has this same policy. Um, we have to buy it on our own and it drives me nuts too. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get my stamp birthday cards myself uh -huh. <laughs> or wedding or whatever. And if I do a holiday, you know, and I do a Merry Christmas to some and a Happy Hanukkah to others, depending on who they are, I buy them myself. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts? Is this okay? Is everyone okay with this? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think there's consensus to go ahead with that one. What is information? What is yes. consensus? That well, that's yeah, that's that's majority. Um, we we haven't four. voted on it yet, but she's thinking it's going to go that way. <laughs> <laughs> Unless somebody pulls it out. Okay, P. Members are not permitted to send a stamped envelope paid for by discretionary funds to a constituent, including as part of a request to return anything from a constituent to such member. I'm okay with that. Okay. Yep. Yes. Um, Q. Members may request additional tangible support from the city manager beyond that supplied to other members to assist with effectively carrying out the duties of the sixth city council member. Our section. Oh man. <laughs> <coughs> we are I wonder it so long. The reason it's in there is because of ADA issues, and mm -hmm. a council member shouldn't have to come before the entire council and explain that they've got a specific issue that's just absolutely inappropriate. There, and Council Member Barentine has said three or four times during this discussion, a council member may have a specific need to get their job done and they have the right to get their job done. So this actually gives you the flexibility to deal with those kind of issues. Got it. Okay, so if we, if we don't qualify it though, which we probably shouldn't qualify it, but then it can be interpreted. Remember that you've just by consensus agreed that you're going to have a quarterly update of expenses and these are discretionary funds uh, but it may be that in order to get the modified keyboard it's going to be eight hundred dollars so uh, the, the city manager is going to say yeah I realize that you have rheumatoid arthritis your fingers don't type right so yes you're going to have this modified and, and then you'll he'll put the extra two hundred dollars with it but it will show up on the expenditure report because it's a public expenditure. Okay, thank you. Council Member Cuesta? Yeah, it seems that number two seems to carve out the ADA um, purchases, which absolutely it should. Number one just seems like I can come in and I need more pencils or I need more envelopes. I need yeah. more paper. I like your chair. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and from there. So it, it seems to me that yeah. the ADA. Um, purchases which absolutely should just be covered and not have to go before counselors made public <coughs> are covered in two. I think one is the slippery slope. They could put you in a bad spot. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so I'll read one. The city manager shall make available to all members of the city council such office supplies as are reasonably needed to carry out the duties of a city council person. Office supplies include paper, envelopes, computer, internet access, printer and appropriate software compatible with the city systems, the reasonable use of the copy machine and other supplies as may be reasonably required from time to time. Office equipment, telephone, desks, file cabinets, chairs, etc. shall not be provided to council persons. The city manager shall have available for council the occasional use of office space in city hall for typing, meetings, etc as requested. Supplies associated with constituency communications are not provided for within this paragraph. 
Office supplies shall not be used in a manner that would violate <coughs> the Fair Campaign Practices Act or any other law. <coughs> any comments? Councilmember Olson. I think I think it's fine, but I, I can see <coughs> where something might get out of line, and we'd need to hear from you when that does. Um, Manager Tech, but here I, I I was thinking, okay, have I ever done any of these things? Have I ever, I, I've come in and asked Sam over here to help me with my internet access no several problem. times, so that yeah. happens. I've been in meetings with some folks, like when um, Director Hargrove and I were working on the Cities of Service thing, we were coming up with something, so oh, let me go make a copy of that for you, and I took it with me. So things like that where I've never come in and said, you know, we make 20 copies of this thing for me, but I could imagine once in a while, that does happen with people. So I, I don't, you know, and if I were going to walk for the flood district like we were going to and we were going to uh -huh. give 120 oh, yeah. um, things, would could we come in and get a copy of that to sure. say, hey, those aren't home, we're going to tape it on the door. It seems like there's some reasonable things, but we'd need you and yep. both of you maybe and other staff to be telling us if it's getting abused. And that does put the job on you, but that's why you get paid the... Again, heretofore, this hasn't happened. Yeah. And, and I'm happy to let you use the uh, IBM Selectric that we have in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, this hasn't happened. But it, it could, the way this is written, it could. But again, you're going to find, no matter what, if any one of you came in and said, I need some help with something, we're going to drop what we're doing and we're going to help you so long as it's not completely you know, onerous with... Hey, we're building the stage for the next Super Bowl or something. So, and even with the flood thing, yeah. you actually brought that to council, and we all yeah. kind of we said, said yeah, exactly, you would, you would do it. So it wasn't like you were going, "Hey, do this for me." Right. So I, I get what I you're can saying. See where there yeah. would be things like that. Like what? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. what are you concerned? Mm -hmm. I'm, I oh, oh, okay. Leave it. I'm saying leave it. I don't know. Oh, you just gave an example where somebody came in and had somebody run off a bunch of copies that later resulted in a violation that we've got new rules yeah. on. So it does happen. It it does it can happen. And, and again, happened? well, happens? that was the campaign campaign, campaign the practices. the campaign practices act violation that transpired last year. We were asked. But to we've do taken it. care of that with something else. I mean, w w yes, with two something else's ninety days before, and the mailing has to be done out if it's done with taxpayer money. So the copies would be if taxpayer that one money. If had just gone to his email and website here, it would have been fine, right? I mean, that's the other piece. But to answer, answer your question, that okay. was already covered in two but previous things. I just want to make a bunch of these copies. I'm just going to slap them on people's doors. Then it's not a mailing. Yeah. So which rule would prohibit it? Uh, yeah. I, and again, I don't review stuff, people's stuff either. I mean, in, the, in this instance, it was hmm. went straight to a he, Printed them on himself and well, at yeah. some point, I, I don't know how when we trust. Uh, yeah. So, um, just to clarify, uh, this paragraph <coughs> is I pulled this from four different sections of the existing policy. So, this kind of this is those repetitive things that were just kind of flipping up everywhere. This paragraph is about things that are outside your discretionary funds. Basically, if you want to come and make copies, the city manager is not required to say. Councilmember Martinez came in, made these copies at 50 cents a page. I've deducted this from her discretionary funds. I think what this is saying is occasionally the, the job of being a city council member requires you to have a little bit of help, and that's not going to be part of your discretionary funds. So, anyway. Councilmember Bernstein. I, that's the problem is I, I put a bracket around this because I don't know that this is where this belongs necessarily because it makes it seem as if it's part of the discretionary fund when in in part it is saying exactly what you're saying that there is a piece of doing the job and you need to make sure that you have this available to you within some confines I see that it's trying to put some confines on there but um, then I also where it's at is like well then if I ask for a copy they're gonna start going 10 20 okay here's two pieces but I, I got to be able to do my job and I'm not gonna you know that that would be ridiculous and it would also be a huge waste of staff time so but I also don't want people running off a bunch of flyers and and so it says reasonable I, I mean I, I don't know the reasonable use of a copy machine and other supplies we did have um, office equipment telephone to, you know Sometimes somebody needs, uh, we, we're sitting on chairs. We have chairs available to us. You made that. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm pretty sure this isn't coming out of my discretionary fund. Yeah, so, 
So, you know, actually, now I know why I have this written up there. In the old policy manual, it was written under policy concerning the use of office supplies and city staff. Right. So is there a place to put that under a separate heading? Because that does make <coughs> more sense. Then it is not tied to. We um, can put it back under a separate heading. Um, just as I said, I, as I was going through, I found I think it was four different provisions, and I think they're repetitive and they need to all be in the same paragraph. But mm -hmm. if you want to pull that paragraph out and give it its own heading, it is your policy. Well, then it just it takes it back out of the discretionary funds and puts it under. And so let me read paragraph three because that goes with it as well. Use of public meeting space must be scheduled, but no cost shall be charged for meetings to which all members of the public are welcome. Meeting space for limited attendance meetings shall be charged in accordance with standard rental rates for use of this space. And so I guess my question is, I use this room. We don't charge you. We don't, you don't charge me, but that's where this policy comes from, correct? Correct. What does that mean, limited space? Well, we have limited space. Um, you know, limited attendance, you mean? Or limited space? space for limited attendance meetings. Yeah, so that's basically saying if you've got 30 or less people uh, I mean that to me that's limited I'm not talking about making Hamden Hall available and competing mm. with Hamden Hall or this room can obviously accommodate lots of people but we can give you library room space as well or even use of your council conference room upstairs that's the larger room that's not what's meant there that, that that's not what it refers to though uh, what it refers to is if it's if the entire public is welcome yeah. even if only 30 members of the public show up there is no cost to the space okay. but if you're using a room that typically does have a cost yes and you're not allowing all members of the public if someone comes in and says I would like to sit through this I'm just interested and, and you give them the evil eye and force them out basically that's not a public meeting you're using the a public meeting space for private purposes yeah. and if you're going to use a public meeting for private purposes there is a cost associated with that. You can use your discretionary funds for that, but it, it, it needs to be acknowledged you're using a public space for your own private purposes. Okay, thank you. Council Member Cuesta? Thank you, and I am noticing a, another line in Q1, uh, second sentence from the last. Supplies associated with constituency communications are not provided for within this paragraph. So I use the example, I come in and give me a thousand caps and we go slap them on people's door. Would be outside of this. Although so would that flood letter that we were just discussing. Mm -hmm. So that would not qualify Except here. for it was approved by council. Right. Uh, so then if council says we can run off, if you get council's approval, you can run off as many copies as you want? No, Is that what you're saying? But it was for the purpose. We agreed to the purpose that right. they wanted to do it. We said, if you're willing to go ahead and deliver a bunch of stuff information, to save staff and money and mailing, and you're willing to walk it, go for it. We kind of agreed to that. I, just I, I wouldn't say that that's what I would consider constituency communication, I guess. The letter on the people's doors in the constituency is not a constituency Not about urban flood and drainage and a pipe going through there. Correct. Not about flood plain. That's, I wouldn't consider that a constituency. That's a, Lorette's doing this. I've helped with this Broadway project, I've done this, it's some kind of thing that makes it seem like here's the issue, issue based or something. That was a communication piece that we agreed to. And I think that's the city's job and they did the job for them and he was okay. And I don't think that's outside the boundaries of the uh, city paying for such a uh, communication, but I think that's absolutely communication. It's text on paper that you're putting on somebody's door, they're going to read it. You're communicating with them. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely constituency. It's like, to me, just a strict definition. Certainly that's constituency communication. Um, okay. So we could remove that language. No, I, I, I mean, I would, I, I, I like that they could walk around with the paper and save the city money. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it would save us money if you did that. Uh -huh. Okay, Council Member Olson. I have a question just for information. When you two just came on, were you give? Or do we give people uh, letterhead like we used to and, and envelopes? Because no. we used to just get them, and we had a, and so they were printed. And we each got a ream. Nope. I still no. have mine. No. My t yeah. Why not? Really? Okay. We didn't get it either when we came on. That was well, I actually saw some leftover. <laughs> oh, I never got any of that. Did you, Amy? 
Okay. Because I, I, I don't. I don't know. I didn't think about it either. But we. Mm. But we did. So she just brought yeah. it up. I never thought about it. If and you so look at everybody, got that along with their yeah. uh, business cards. It was just part of here's letterhead, yeah. and here is and for official business, and we just all got it, and you could send stuff out. Yeah, we gave you business cards, but if you look at your budget this year for general operating supplies, I reduced it and didn't hand out paper to anybody. We don't do that unless you have a specific need or request for it. Mm. So if I want to get a card that's got the city's logo on it, I, I get one at a time, and i got to get your permission? I'm trying to save you money. <laughs> so if you, have a, if you have a purpose that you want to have a car, send a card out, I'm happy to uh, facilitate that for you. But some yeah. yeah, I guess we'll uh, go ahead and solve that off. No, I'm talking <coughs> about being able to do my job, and I, wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't no, ever I'm not gonna reduce stop you from the doing paper your job. For, for anybody's office, but I, I think that might be a little... Okay, Council Member Wink. Um, to our most recent discussion, I think it, I'm fine with that as long, I mean, Manager Keck just said if we ask for it, we can have it, yeah. so I don't see. And that's why I was asking, because I said as long as they can still get it. Then right. so, because yeah. when other council people left, when Bob McCaslin left, and when Jill uh, when, Wilson left, yeah. they said, we don't need, we didn't use this paper, here's it back. Right. right. And I'm like, well, thank you. You just gave me like so a to automatically well, spend don't the give money us so for much all of us. Not using it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's a good savings. Um, yeah. Just reserve it when we need it. We give and on an as-needed so basis. Do we want this? Okay. Are we uh, being asked if we want this in a separate section? So that was just my next question: Is it council's <laughs> desire that we would put it in <clears throat> a separate heading, like it? was perhaps before only the first paragraph the other two paragraphs do specifically refer to discretionary spending oh two and three yeah to. okay correct well so there would only be one can we shall we leave it here what shall we do that's that was kind of a little orphan that's why i put it <laughs> there oh. leave, it. Leave, it. leave it let's okay let's uh, leave it just go on record i do support two two and three i do not support two one okay thank you okay yeah i don't support any of the three of these being under the, the discretionary fund um, especially for the printed co uh, printed copies of document packets, I need that to do my job, and I will not have that under discretionary fund. I think that's absolutely <coughs> ridiculous. I hope that's it. Okay. Wait, number number two. Have you been charged already? No, I don't. But if this section is under discretionary fund, that lends it to to go ahead and be charged to my discretionary fund and that's that's how i do my job i see q is when you're out of discretionary funds pardon uh q to me is outside of additional, discretionary funds additional tangible support. that's what we just what you guys all just said is you want to leave it in the discretionary fund i thought no he's just he's saying a q is under discretionary funds Correct, and I said um, that I wanted discretion <coughs> that taken out of discretionary fund. I thought you guys just decided to do it. All right, just a second. Council Member Wayne. I just wanted you to finish what you were saying to um, clarify. I just, the, line. I'm thinking that it probably, it doesn't have to be under di discretionary funds, uh, even Q, correct? Because this is, members may request additional tangible support, not necessarily discretionary funds okay so you want to move it I, I, if you we get to decide okay if we move Q that would include one two and three and uh, two people have suggested we get rid of one I think I first of all shall we put Q one two and three and then we'll talk about whether we're keeping it all under policy concerning the use of office supplies and city staff, instead of leaving it under discretionary funds. Council Member Olson. I think I'm confused on number two now as to what actually is going to get charged and why. <coughs> so I can go either way, but I, I, I think I read this wrong the first time, and then tonight I'm looking at it thinking, this is about what people need to do their job. So I, I would not want to say that if people need printed documents, I mean, as much as I get frustrated, <laughs> uh -huh. 
yeah, it's needed. So if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. Like I would, I didn't, I didn't know that those shouldn't be charged to discretionary funds unless, I mean, I was thinking that there was something else for some reason. I wasn't thinking of our weekly <coughs> document packets, and that's what this is referring to. Is okay. everybody, are you all okay with that? Uh, is that what you're intending, even a weekly uh, City Attorney Brown uh, printed copy of document packets would include the weekly, um, your weekly packet? I think it does include the weekly packet. I think what it's looking at is there are, it, it's listing all of the extra cost items that I don't know, honestly, I have no idea if they're currently being charged or not currently being charged, not. but uh, all of the extra cost items associated with being a council member. Um, and I think the question before you is, should those be accounted for as part of discretionary <coughs> funds? Uh, again, you as a body need to decide how you want to account for the way you're spending money. And I guess I do still like two and three, uh, because we can waive by the majority of council members any extra cost when we see fit. So I would say yes, there's your weekly packet and you want that printed out, sure. That's something I, I'd be in. happy to make that um, question. Uh, admit I did, that's one person saying that. But one is, but you don't like one. I, so two yeah, and three are like fine, one but one you don't like. Okay. Uh, correct. Okay, um, thank you. Council Member Berentine. And I don't want to put myself or any council member under whether it's okay with the current council for them to be able to do that. We've gone rounds with this, and um, I don't want to stop anybody from being able to do the job that they need to do the best way they can. And not that anybody here would do that, but um, if if, if a majority of council decides that they want to go ahead and make it difficult for somebody else to do their job, then they can. I don't think it should be up to the rest of council to be able to stop somebody from doing their job the way they see fit because they don't think it's, they think it's silly. Just a point they, of order. I think he already said yes to you on Yes, he did. Oh, I thought, no, no I no, thought no. you were going the other way. Uh, I, sub I think two and three should be in there, but I think you should, sure, print, print the packets for a weekly packet. Except, well, so I thought you said leave two the way it is. Uh, yes, but it allows us to say. Right, and that's what I'm disagreeing with. Okay. Because I don't think, I, I don't like the part where uh, if costs are waived by an action of the majority of the members of city council. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that you guys use a, a laptop up at the dais. I think it opens us up for a lot of problems, and I think you are not capable of doing your job as well. So I think that if I could get a majority of council, I go, we just get rid of your 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 little laptops. You're you're distracted. You don't know what you're doing. You can't find the stuff. Everybody's got to do paper. And if you go, this makes it easier for me to do my job. I don't think a majority of council should be able to stop you from being able to do the job you, the way that you can do it best. It's already been done, it's already been suggested, it's already happened before, and maybe this council won't do it, but past councils have tried, and future councils may, so I wanna make sure that we have a policy that allows everybody to be able to do the job the way they see fit, without okay. dependent, being dependent on the majority of council. Okay, I, I do agree with Council Member Barentine in that fact. Um, I stand by it. I think two and three are good as written. And I, I opened it up to everybody else's mm -hmm. conversation. Um, the last two years. <coughs> I'm, okay. There, I'm okay with two and three as they're written. As they're written? Yeah. So let me read two again. Unless such additional assistance is pursuant to ADA mm -hmm. or if costs are waived by action of a majority of the members of council, the cost of extra cost items will be charged against the member's discretionary fund balance. Extra cost items include, but are not limited to, printed copies of document packets. Does that necessarily mean the packets that we get every week, or does that mean document packets for some other 
purpose? Probably both. But I don't know what other purpose there would be. Can we take that one uh, part, part, part out? out? Was Number this Wilson. in here before? Or you didn't? No. This was in here, you're saying? Uh, parts of this were in here, and parts of it I pulled out of another policy because it was vague and it didn't make sense. I, I'll, I, I read this differently when I read it based on our his, my history, which is eight and a half years, and so it's all it is. But it is when we started to use these, and it came up because we all wanted to start to limit some of the costs that it was to print lots of things and take them to our house all the time. And many of us were willing to use these instead to cut costs. We made it very clear that those who don't want to do this don't have to use it this way, that they can have exactly what you're doing because we didn't want to impede the work that you were doing. If you, and Bob McCaslin was one of them. He just didn't like doing it that way, and that's the only way he was going to get it. So I, I still stand by that as the way to do it. I don't believe that this was ever written to say that those weekly meeting document packets mm -hmm. would not be like this. I think it was over and above, but I don't ever remember agreeing to this one way or the other. We didn't even have a conversation about it, except when we got these and how we were uh -huh. going to use it. And we had lots of, you know, that's the last time we even talked about it. I don't know, Council Member Berentine, what you're talking about going around and around. We've never really had a conversation that's well, really been much of anything on this. Right. So and now, I, was, uh, now we are. I appreciate what you're sharing and, and allowing that. I just would like to make certain that it's put in there so it's very clear that a council member that wants a paper <coughs> packet would not have right. to be paid. So that's what I'm saying, and I, I just I, I think that we're reading a lot into these as if in the past we haven't. We I mean obviously we haven't charged discretionary funds for this. Yeah. We were never intended. I, we never right. had a that's conversation that said it was going to go that way. Right. Because so. it's t it really you don't take the money from the discretionary funds to pay for council packets anyway. No. It comes from something different. Right. Printing. Okay. So if. I, if there were over and above some things, like if you wanted to have, and you already, I mean, we, we already do this. Like I'm trying to think of other things that I think we might have been thinking about, like maybe CORA requests or something that are really long documents that one person wants. It's like, hmm. you know, I think maybe that's what this might have been about, but I don't remember us ever holding anybody to that. I'm sure that Council Member McCaslin got it by hard copy. Okay. All right. Um, I actually, I just want to say this. I want to bring this to an end um, fairly soon. It's almost 930. I think we've made huge strides this evening. Um, and I think we're getting close to Can we finish this it. one? Because um, if we come back to it again, I'm going to have a brain hemorrhage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we, should, we I can, should not say that in this room. We, can, we can finish this one. Um, let's get this done so we don't have to go back over it. Council Member Marantine. So Q, are we taking Q out of the discretionary fund or leaving it in under the discretionary fund section? Which one? Well, actually, two does use the words discretionary fund. OK. Then you, you have to take, I'm, I'm not, it has in the two years I have been on here already um, the, my ability to get a paper packet has already come up several times to be taken away, and I um, am not so um, secure with whatever this council does in the moment or situationally or how they would feel. It's already happened in the last few years, and I am not comfortable with that being in there, not for myself or anybody that would come to follow that would need to go ahead and <coughs> have this or something else maybe different than this in order to do their job. No matter how kind you might be, Council Member Quest, I cannot rely on your kindness for the future. I would rather rely on the policy. It's bizarre thinking Come. that anybody here is even going to say no. It's no. already all happened. Right, all right, Council Member. Okay. I think it's strange. We don't make policy Council based on Berentine, trust. Please. We make policy so that everybody has fairness and equitability. Okay, Council Member Berentine. You know. uh, okay. Again, I, if, if you think everybody here is going to ambush you and not let you have your weekly package. That's a misstatement. Council Member Berentine, please. Council Member Berentine, please. please, please, ask member Berentine, please. No, I never said anybody Council would ambush me. Council Member Berentine, please stop. Please stop. Then please. Council Member Berentine, it will be addressed. I don't like to miss. 
statement on that. That's not what um, was said. Council Member Barentine. Um, Council Member Martinez. I was going to say, could we just add an item here that says um, does not include weekly packets? Meaning that the weekly, weekly packets aren't part of this <coughs> policy. Could we just add that language in there? Would that Is there a way to do that? It, you guys can do anything That's you right. want. I'm just waiting for direction and I will rewrite to conform to consensus. Okay, I, and I just, I do want to clear something up. Um, that it's, I do agree with having policy for policy's sake. There, ha, there were battles in the last two years over this where certain council members were attacked. I personally feel very comfortable with this council and I believe that we have a great relationship. Um, but there were times that it did happen. Um, so that is all that I'm saying. Not with anybody in this room. Um, so I think, but I want to move forward from here. I just want to, to have that. Uh, Council Member Olson. I, I just want to go on the record that I do not recall any conversation amongst any past council that said it limited people's ability to get packets. I really don't, and so if there were side comments made and innuendos, perhaps that happened, and I, that's too bad. I do think that this <laughs> this is showing that there is mistrust here, and so I think it, we need to make it clear in here and we start to have a decorum process that helps us deal mm -hmm. with one another. When okay, we point of disagree. order. Point of but order. I really don't want to move on to the point of decorum. I don't I, disagree. I'm not. I don't. Now. Okay. That is the way I think we need to look at this, though. It's, I mean, we have a, a well, no, I'm not suggesting tonight. The other thing is, is I do think there's a question in the minds of some people in the public of why do we buy people computers if they don't use them for this? Mm -hmm. So why do they need one if they're going to do it by hard copy? Maybe that's the conversation we ought to also have to say, well, we believe that you can do both. And maybe someone needs a computer at home to do their email. I don't know, but I think that has been raised. I've had people, constituents ask me that are sitting out there. Not my, they aren't my constituents. They're people sitting there asking. And then when someone says, oh, I didn't get that upgrade or I didn't get that thing, we well, have a computer to look up your email. Why didn't you know that there was a change in something? And instead it gets here that night that someone didn't get the hard packy. So I do think there are issues that have been raised that are legitimate too. But it's, it's not about whether someone should be getting everything. It's, I think that's always been, it's fine. But if you're not going to use your laptop or email to see what's going on, then that's another issue. But Okay. Um, okay. Madam Mayor, I think this has been very, uh, an incredibly helpful and educational conversation for staff to hear. And we weren't quite sure going into it because we hadn't had this kind of conversation before what appropriate responses should be of staff. But it does seem that when you come to a policy that's a sticking point like this one, that we should just pull it out. And then the very last conversation on policy manual is we'll present you with those two or three um, policies the, like this one. You'll, you'll have had several weeks to think your way through it. And you can deal with these outside the policy instead of, you know, going back and forth because I think every one of you have made your position absolutely clear, uh, but it does take a while to process all this information. So if you are amenable, what we'd like to do moving forward is as we come to very difficult to resolve policies or proposed policies, you'll just uh, designate those as as a policy that needs to be reviewed separate from the document itself, we'll pull it out, we'll keep a list. Council Member Olson. I think that's great, well said, and I think that's probably what I meant by the, just the term decorum, it's probably more process. It's, that it's a process that we should be using for this, and I think that's a great way to handle it. Okay. I, what I don't want to do is come back to this over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Someone can write it up well, and we have some choices, it'll be easier to make a decision. Okay, so is there consensus that we can go ahead and remove this one um, until after the fact and then we'll talk about adding it back in? Meaning we pull Q entirely at this point. Just for now, just for now. 
Is that what the city attorney was suggesting? I'm just suggesting that we put to, you allow staff to put together a list of those handful of policy and procedures or proceed, sorry, I'm getting my terminal, it's late, that you allow staff to put together a list of those policies that are specifically difficult to resolve. And I don't expect there's gonna be very many of them, but let's say two or three. And instead of you um, struggling for an hour or two over each of them, we just put them into a single document, bring them back for your review, and you'll have had time to think your way through them and decide what it is you're ready to live with or not live with. I just think it'll make the process a little smoother, and it'll make it a lot easier for me to go back and, and clean up this document as I'm trying to fix it. Council Member Preston. Thank you. Um, I think going forward on the next issues, that's good. We just went round and round on this one, and I don't know if we need to go through this one again. I think there was a good suggestion by Council Member Martinez where we can allevi alleviate the immediate concern where weekly packets would be excluded or whoever that language gets worked in. That seems to be the main crux here. Uh, so if we make that exception, hopefully we can move on past this one. That's Council Member Wink. Uh, thank you. Um, so I like the um, proposal by the city attorney because it seems that there may be a couple of items, a small number of items. So given perhaps that it's not just about the, um, the weekly packets, um, but, and yes, I, I concur. We, we have been going around and around um, for a while. We've been discussing it for a while tonight. Um, I like the idea of taking a decision, taking action that enables us to move forward with the bigger part of everything else. So for that purpose, I think this proposal makes beautiful sense. Let's pull aside problem areas, move forward. We can sort that out later, and we're not just impeding our progress altogether. So for that reason, I, I love this. Time to, to process things never hurts. I think as well, so I think I, I, I vote for what, what the city attorney has proposed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Council Member Berentine. Um I would agree with what the city attorney is suggesting. Council Member Cuesta had a problem with number one here. Uh, most of number two is specifically directed at the packet, um, and I have, I have a huge concern with that. Um, it certainly... Uh, I am very regretful that any of this has been put into that there's any mistrust here, but I am, um, I don't think it's a lack of trust. I think it's a lack of um, historical background for what's happened. And um, I understand maybe some members don't see the need for it or maybe remember what's uh, gone on, but the historical content of it, uh, the context of it, is very important to me, and is and is <coughs> true. So, and it's something that I don't want to see happen in the future, no matter how much I trust all of the people at this table right here. Um, so, I would agree that we could, um, considering we have more than one section here, I would agree with uh, uh, Council Member Wink that maybe we should just go ahead and let this sit for a little bit and okay, thank you. see what they write up. Okay, thank you. If there are no more comments, we will move on um, <clears throat> to um, the potential ballot question issues and discussion. Is Could there a any point of um, order here? Um, we said that after 9 o'clock that we were going to take some kind of feel for how long a meeting is going to go. Okay. It's after 9 o'clock, so I just wanted to see what we've got. And I, okay. I have to run Thank and you. pee real quick. All right. Um, so do we want to just leave that uh, question go till next time? I, or, um, or the time? I didn't think that there probably were any questions there. But, okay, <gasps> shall we... Um, are you all ready to adjourn other than council member choice? Um, council member Olson. Do we all think this might take us five minutes or less? If so, then I'm ready to do it. And if not, and we hit five minutes and we have a timer on, then we 
play it. Okay, and that's agenda item four. Yeah, okay. the, the uh, election thing. I imagine it's in that ballpark is five or less. Works for me. Council member Wink. I want to believe it will be five minutes. <laughs> 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 You're trying to believe that, right? <laughs> if it was, would you move forward? Absolutely, but I... Okay, uh, let's... <laughs> you know... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got my timer going. Okay. Will it be... Will it sound <laughs> loudly, audibly for everyone? <laughs> yes. And we promise to stop talking when it sounds? Okay. Well, who would okay. like to go first? On the, uh, on the potential, we're moving forward on the potential ballot issues or questions. Um, does anyone, Council Member Wink, do you have? Oh, sorry, it's still up for the court. <laughs> sorry. Does anyone have any potential ballot issues or questions? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> you were making us nervous for a second. <laughs> okay, so. There are none. Seeing there are none, we will not put this back on. I mean, there is there is information here, correct, that we would know what the timeline is? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. I, I think that will take care of that. So um, Council Member Barentine? So if anybody should, this doesn't preclude anybody from bringing something up. It's just that they know that what the timeline is if they want to do it. To yes. bring it to Council. Okay. Yes. And that's really what I thought probably would come of this. Um, that's really I mean. So... Okay, thank you very much. Um, one so minute. it took one minute. We, <laughs> we will go ahead with uh, council members' choice. Um, I do have uh, one question. There is a, um, well, under mayor's choice, mm -hmm. there's a meeting on Thursday night at Swedish Hospital at um, in the Pine Room at 6.30. Um, is there any feedback that we need to talk about about what happened at the first meeting that would be helpful? Um, yes, I, I loved the setup. I thought it was really great. I got there a little late, so but I think that Mr. Wilson said that you didn't do um, any rules of conduct with one another or any kind of ground rules. But if you did, yes, they were written on my, on my page, and I okay. forgot to. So I think we need to. I was yeah, in a absolutely. group that people were calling other people's houses crap yeah. and other kinds of things, and it just kept going on. And I, if someone had been in that group that owned one of those houses, and I hope they come mm. out to these. I have sent so many emails out to people. Um, I don't want another person saying such derogatory things. I just think if we could help them, you know, they have good <coughs> feelings. That's what we want, but to not use derogatory yeah. terms about each other's properties or that's that's a absolutely. Yeah. And, well, so I ground rules, regardless. Add how that big to the ground rules. Make sure that we <laughs> express them. Yeah. Uh, in terms of facilitation, uh, for those there, we just kind of shared duties, and so. I think that worked pretty well. We just have to make a judgment call based on how many council members are able to attend on Thursday and how many members of the public show up. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that we've been through it once, uh, hopefully it'll, it'll go a little bit smoother. And, uh, what I've done is provided um, some guidance on, on how to run the meeting, uh, and in that is the ground rules. So I'll just make sure to add. I, don't, I haven't looked at them except that night, but I think you had some... Do you have anything in there about monopolizing too, of just talking an awful lot so that other members then don't say very much? Just balance yourself. Sure, mm -hmm. I can. Uh, I can uh, monitoring, self monitoring. I'm happy to send, send that <laughs> out to council prior to <laughs> Thursday to take a look at. Great. Otherwise, I, I mean, I thought it was really helpful. Even the comments people were, were saying out of great frustration or whatever, I just want to be kind to our neighbors that might come. So, um, are, will you provide that paper for us at the meeting also? I yes. mean, that was Again. that was very helpful. Yeah. And I think um, if we did get it ahead of time, it would be helpful also. Yes, I will send it to you in advance. Absolutely. Okay. And then, um, I had another question. I, but it just, I, maybe it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Forget it. Amy. Okay. I was going to say, um, <laughs> 
Thank you. Uh, I got great feedback from folks on the format. They really liked kind of the, the questions, the, the end result of the theme, and um, also uh, folks liked the ability to also then go and write notes on the big sheets. Um, like Council Member Olson said, some folks didn't get the chance to talk as much as others, so I think that was a good way for them also to provide other input, maybe if some certain folks dominated the conversations or whatnot. Um, and thanks for all the staff help there. I know it was supposed to be more council run. Um, it was. It, it was uh, we were a little, you know, rusty, but I think we got it figured out. So thank all the staff that. Great run. That Great run. Yes, absolutely. It was very well organized, and and I think it will be um, much smoother this time. And I I got great feedback as well. I, especially in the group that we were in, I feel like people felt like they were listened to. Um, and I mean, there's been some other things where people, um, and I do think sometimes when um, people are in a group, um, some people might not share as much if they know that what they were gonna share was represented also. Um, but I do, we do need to give everybody an opportunity to share. So thank you very much for that. I greatly appreciate it. And you know that thing that you put in the packet about what's put out there? Was that just put on the website or was that mailed out to people about the... Um, this letter? About the date mm -hmm. and location. It was not mailed. It was um, primarily social media uh, through our email uh, listserv and then in the magazine. As well. I just saw a little one in the magazine. Yeah, very small. Yeah, the yeah, one in the part magazine. Of our uncertainty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, didn't, it didn't stick out. Well, that might have been justified. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And when I went to look for it, I thought, well, no wonder nobody noticed it. But hmm. the other picture was did go out to social media. Yes. Correct. And okay. it's on. Okay. Yeah. Um. All right. I don't think I have anything else. So who would like to go first with council member's choice? Council member uh, No report. Okay. Today is my daughter's birthday and on her birthday every year if I'm in a public setting, I say that she would not be here tonight had I not asked for a second opinion from a doctor who wanted to do a procedure that would have aborted her. Mm. And I think it's so important for all of us not to blame people for mistakes they make but to actually take ownership of, you know, ask for second opinions, get more information, always be searching. Yeah. Because I did that, and while well, I got a handwritten note of apology from this <laughs> doctor who, who misdiagnosed me and was sort of a fill-in for someone else, my brother who's a doctor said, that's because he doesn't want to write it on anything else. Um, I, you know, he's young, and but she is just such a gift, and it's such a wonderful day to celebrate her and to know that, especially women, take charge of your bodies and do what's right. So there's my public service announcement for the night. <laughs> Happy birthday to your daughter. Happy birthday. Yes. Happy birthday. Council Member Martinez. Uh, I would just like to request that the rest, our, our continuation of our policy discussion be on hopefully the next uh, study session. Okay. So we can keep trucking forward and through this. We, we are moving forward, and actually there is commitment to this. Thank you for that. Uh, Council Member Wink? No report. Thank you. Council Member Brantine? I, um, I appreciate what she shared. That's very uh, touching when Joseph was little. Because of all of his disability stuff, I was with Parent to Parent and a lot of the disability groups. And every year that they did their conference, and I think it was only three or four when I got on those boards, um, there would be people up there, <coughs> children with Down syndrome, very, very severe disabilities, who had subsequent pregnancies and were tested and told that the child would have a disability or was ill or would not live and turned out perfectly normal. And so it's, it's always a very inspiring thing. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's really so touching and never been, and never been um, didn't know that. Um, I just want to encourage everybody for um, March 22nd for that community meeting on the homeless issue to go ahead and uh, um, make sure that we have people from the community come in and, and, and get involved with this. I've gotten so much feedback from the last meeting and I'm 
so very grateful for the people that I tend to forget are watching out there, that it's not just the people in the room, and we need to make sure that uh, we get all the voices at the table there, so. Thank you. City Manager? Uh, no report, Mayor. Thank you. City Attorney? No report this evening. Thank you, this meeting is adjourned. Linda, is that your youngest daughter? Or, uh... Yep. Yep.